All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to another stream. Uh, as you can see, I'm here today with uh, Johanan Ratz. Is that how you say your name? Johanan. Everyone's screwed up the first time. Johanan Ratz. Uh, welcome, uh, Johanan. And we're here today to talk about the digital physics argument. I think you you just mentioned that you saw my uh, discussion a few months ago with uh, um, Inspiring Philosophy, where we talked about this, and you got in touch with me and wanted to discuss it further. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interest in this argument? Well, my uh, background is uh, physics. I did a bachelor's in physics, and then I went to try, wanted to research the quantum gravity problem, actually, but eventually I then went to philosophy. I uh, actually sat under J.P. Moreland over in Biola hmm. for a master's degree, and then that's where I've stopped right now. So I, I was actually the guy who originated the digital physics argument, though now it's kind of bifurcated or evolved into two separate uh, phylogenetic branches, as you might call it, is uh, one that's more of a... I mean, really, it's, it, re it reduces to the same physics at the bottom, but it's more of a matter of how you set the thing up. So it's one's more like the version, the original version that I was aiming at has been called the kind of now the emergent space time argument in some respects. Well, I originally called it digital physics argument, but it's been kind of bifurcated now. So, right. Did you say that you're, you did study at Biola or are you still at Biola? I did. I did. Right. What are you doing these days? Right now, I'm kind of in an intermission period. I had a, it's kind of a long story, but due to certain issues in my life that I had not taken care of many years earlier, I ended up with a sort of a meltdown situation <laughs> while doing my master's degree. I got all my coursework done, you know, with good grades and all, despite that. But because of that, I uh, came back to Wisconsin, back home. I got work my debt off, and right now I'm just saving money, so. All right. Well, I hope that that yeah. works out for you. Um, trying to, trying right. to get a paper published actually right now. So, oh, cool. See how that goes. Yeah. Well, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, how you see the the digital physics argument then, and what what you think it um, what you see the goal of the argument as being in particular? Okay. Well, so I can summarize the argument, and we can break down the individual pieces of it. Um, I kind of reformulate it in some respects. The first premise is as in the reformulation of it now, which is, um, so as you saw with IP's argument, version of it, he kind of argues that we're in a, I say a virtual reality, right? Mm -hmm. And while that is not only valid, it's actually literally valid in a certain respect. It's not exactly the same way that you would have a virtual reality, like in you know, the matrix or a, um, you know, like a, a standard computer game or something like that. But it is, I will say virtual in the sense of it, what you're calling physical reality is an illusion, like the, Physical reality as in space, time, matter, and energy. That's not fundamentally real. And what is fundamentally real is information that's being generated from. At that point, the analogy, it's, it's, it's more than an analogy, but it, it, it somewhat diverges. It has the same kind of ontological reality as say, a computer game, but it's, you know, there's differences in the type of information that's generating it, as well as how the information is being processed or how reality is emerging from the information. But the, the idea is that it's, what you're seeing as a physical world is an illusion and that world is being derived from information. And so the, um, if you want to go to very hard physics, I used to use virtual reality parallels because it was very popular with the audience. Cause you could see, you know, here's something in physics and then you see something in a computer game that has the exact same effect appearing. in. it's like a processing glitch. It, it, it comes about not because they program into the computer game, but simply because it's a natural side effect of, information processing you see this these funny parallels appearing between modern physics and uh the behavior of video games and so those are not i, I want to caution when i say that use that because i use that for popularization and it they are valid to some extent but it still is um the the comparisons are not 100 percent accurate there are some differences between how the actual physics operates and the um the behavior of a computer game operates because they're not exactly the same thing, even though they are similar in many respects. So if I want to go to the hard physics of that, and we'll go to something which was actually only just like, it was known about or very strongly um, believed to be the case quite uh, several, some years before this, but it was actually confirmed as of last year. They call it the DS Mera correspondence, which is a acronym for de Sitter space, which is our space time described by general relativity. And corresponding to the called the multi-scale entanglement renormalization ensemble, which is just a, a very fancy word for 
uh, basically large scale quantum entanglements. And so what you have is what you call physical space time emerging from underlying entangled information. So that's the that's if you want to convert the the notion of the world as being a quote unquote virtual reality into hard physics, that is what you would do. You would I would refer to the DS mirror correspondence where you have physical space time emerging from entangled information. Now the second step, uh, second premise, as it were, IP. I remember uh, Gunter, my friend at the Discovery Institute, he was telling me he, he wanted IP to jump on this, and I after he's like disappointed with the debate because he's like, oh no, what IP totally flubbed a perfect opportunity here. Um, because there actually is in my home state, there's a, you may even be familiar with him, a Giulio Tononi. He's like pretty famous, I believe, right? Integrated uh, integration theory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is, I mean, this is right now, this is the, there, there is no one, you know, e even among materialism, there is, conflict as to what the correct theory of mind is and his model is technically panpsychist though when you combine it with this sort of information theory i, I use the word and you notice you were questioning what the, what how digital physics related to all this digital physics but digital physics i simply mean in a physics based on information so instead of using matter as your fundamental ontological simply using information so it's kind of a scientific immaterialism so you can combine this with uh, Tononi's IT, and specifically, he has this. Had this. Uh, I forget when the paper was written, but it's some time ago. The um, consciousness is integrated information, a provisional manifesto. Footnote fourteen. He has this little note where he says uh, some of the effect of um, uh, integrated information and entanglement to the extent that you cannot disturb two elements independently; they are informationally one. So he basically says that entangled information actually is identical with integrated information which is, of course, consciousness or fine in his model. So I did, I recognized this. I'm like, well, you know, this is the number one theory of consciousness and it describes consciousness as, you know, it, it's something that is ubiquitous to any system that has information in it. I realized, well, that implies entangled information as well. And of course, I have my own views on consciousness. I think that it's fundamental as well and that it's not going to show up in, I think, I'm, I don't believe in emergentism. We'll, we'll probably talk about that somewhat later. But um he then, I, I, I realized you can take this this fact that entangled information counts as integrated information under his model, and you combine it with, you know, emergent space time from entangled information, you suddenly get, you know, space time emerges from entangled information, entangled information is consciousness, therefore space time emerges from consciousness. And then at that point, you can, there are some rarefied forms of this, of atheistic idealism. It's not as common, but it does exist. So what I then do is I point to this 2013 um, experiment that confirmed the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is the Schrodinger equation for the universal wave function. So it's just like the Schrodinger equation you do for a standard wave function, but you're using it for the entire universe now. And uh, it has a very unique property where... Um, the time variable drops out. So the universal wave function is something that actually stands apart from time. It has this very peculiar property where it's not, it's literally not in time and time emerges from it. And specifically what they did was they showed that this thing exists because time emerges from entanglement. So the whole notion of time emerging of entanglement would only be contingent upon the universal wave function existing. So they confirmed the existence of a universal wave function. And so the idea then is I don't know if you're familiar with how entanglement works, so how it's defined in quantum mechanics. You know how it's defined in quantum mechanics at all? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, well, in general, it's, it will be helpful to explain ideas for our audience. Okay, so entanglement, you have... Um, you know what a wave function is, right? I mean, you know what a wave function is? The quantum probability... I mean, it's a mathematical description of the quantum probability wave where you have, uh, you know, the, the famed um, observer effect where you're you're not looking at or not measuring with the equipment or whatever, some object and like say an electron. And then when that electron is not being observed or measured, it exists in this superposition of multiple states at the same time. Uh, Schrodinger's cat is, you know, dead and alive at the same time before you open the box and look at it, so to speak. So before you look at or measure it, it's in this state we call a, a probability wave. And we describe that mathematically as a wave function. And um, so then with entanglement, you have two or more objects sharing the same probability wave at the same time. And so 
what happens then is that there's a, a joint quantum state now that both are sharing and you can separate them at vast distances and you can theoretically take them light years apart. And when you collapse the you measure or collapse the, the wave function at the one point, it instantaneously changes the wave function, you know, light years away. Uh, it's actually kind of a, a cool clue because it's, you know, that's the why it's underneath space time is it that that instantaneous effect. It's actually like the, the two are, you know, nozzled up right next to each other when in reality they're light years apart. And the reason is, is that they're, they're actually transcending space there when they do that. So uh, anyway, you have two or more particles sharing the same wave function. They are said to be entangled. Now, when you get to the universal wave function, though, you have this kind of curious thing. And this is not in our reference room, of course, but this is exists at this very high reference frame where literally everything in the entire universe is in a single superposed state at the same time. And that actually exists at a sufficiently high reference frame. And so the argument then is that at that point, you have everything entangled into this single integrated information state. And that actually exists there. And then the idea is that, you know, you have a single conscious state and the conscious state is, or, you know, phi state is just science ease, cognitive science ease for what we call a mind. And so you have the universe arrive, um, emerging from a single cosmic mind, which is completely described by integrated information theory or you know, quantum analog of integrated information theory. And you can call that God and so on, but I, I, I'm thinking, so, uh, I, th I thought you might, uh, after launching your critiquing, I thought you might appreciate the sticking to like a kind of a strictly scientific way of describing the whole thing. A breakdown of just the kind of a yeah. nasty model of God, as it were. Well, well, that that is sort of interesting um, because th certainly the way IP uses this argument is as an argument for some kind of theism. So I think that it would be helpful, at least for, for me, and I think for the audience as well, to clarify exactly what you think the conclusion of the argument is. So you, you mentioned a naturalistic model of God. What, what do you mean by that? Well, there, I mean, this is the kind of the weird thing, because when people say the word naturalistic God, they're thinking Spinoza, right? Which is kind of this like blase pantheism. It's like, well, that's, I mean, it, it seems kind of stupid to posit that because it's like, well, what's the difference between that and atheism, people say, right? Well, this is kind of cool, though, because it's actually, it's naturalistic in the same sense. It, it's everything is as you see it's described purely by science you have bs mera um it and the willard wood equation and those three give you god everything in there is science though but um it does have this cool thing where it's not just sort of this blase pantheism because you have you know the ds mera component which is just quantum gravity and if you go to i don't know if you're familiar with the literature in quantum gravity right now and this is quite shocking actually from like in a, if, if you if you kind of approach it without you know having any knowledge of the field and you you look into it you're like holy crap are you saying they believe that but all the experts in it right now are saying that uh space is an illusion i'm not all the experts but i would probably say well over 95 percent of them it, it, it's pretty much a uniform consensus that space time is emergent and it does not fundamentally exist at the, the bottom level like uh Fatini Markopoulou, she's one of two, or she, she kind of left the field some years back to go into business, but um, for quite some time, she was like one of two top loop quantum gravity theorists in the world. And she was giving talks and she would say, you know, her guess to the quantum gravity problem is that space just doesn't exist. She said, she said in quotes, my guess is space just doesn't exist. And uh, she's saying space is emerging from things that are outside space time. And you see Verlind, uh, who's in string theory, saying the same thing. And she, there are two Verlind brothers they're both in the same field, but they're both saying the same thing. But this is one from Hermann Verlin, and he was saying, um, you know, the the future of the this development with quantum gravity is that we're just going to forget about what space is and what time is, and we're going to have information, and space and time are going to emerge out of the information, basically. And you have people like Susskind referring to space as an illusion. And I had a, a friend who had a whole list of quotes of quantum gravity theorists and they're saying this is like what describing what they think the state of the field is and you know there's i don't know exactly how many approaches to quantum gravity but there are the two main approaches are string theory and loop quantum gravity and they both come to the conclusion of emergent space time so you have space is not fundamentally a real thing and then beneath it there is something that's real and space emerges from it and then you have the runner-up theory of um causal dynamical triangulations which says that it's also emergent space time and i think like most of the runner-up models, especially the, the the foremost ones, also say 
that space is an illusion and it emerges from underlying structures. Okay, so how does that relate to God or some sort of well? So you have of there. God? I mean, it's already it, it's kind of shocking because it already leads you halfway. I mean, it's, it's almost like saying we live in the matrix you know, in an almost very literal sense, not in a you know actual literal sense, but the world is an illusion, and then outside of that, there is a mind and if you, you put the pieces of the physics there, you get to this weird conclusion where our universe is literally um, very much like a dream inside of this gigantic cosmic mind. Okay, yeah. So that is similar to what IP says, I think, um, or at least as I understand it. Um, he, he calls himself, what is it, dual aspect idealist, I think? Um, yeah, I think she, yeah, he says that. Okay, so let me then try to... Um, uh, for for Jay's benefit, uh, I'm in Australia where it is relatively cold at the moment, although probably not cold by. Uh, like well, what's your temperature? Standards, but, uh, what's your temperature? Oh, it's right 10, now? 10 degrees outside. 10, 10 degrees, degrees Celsius? Celsius. What's that in Fahrenheit? Uh, well, I don't know. The rest of the world uses, <laughs> uses st uh, normal units. I know. Um, it's actually funny. I learned there, this is not the case in all cases, but I learned there was a very interesting conversion between. Um, miles and kilometers and i don't know how this happened but it implied that someone way back when when miles were first like must have been way back somehow had to have known about the circumference of the earth because apparently the old unit for a mile when you multiply or divide it by the golden mean you get one kilometer the golden very strange. Mean. i don't know how that happened the that's the golden a mean? Funny piece of trivia that's about 1.6 isn't it which is about right six yeah 1.618 I forget the exact, you know, the mile is, I think it, you know, is like the original mile, which is a little bit different, I think, than our current mile, but hmm. forget where well, I am. Anyway, right, well, well, anyway, um, <laughs> what it is in freedom units. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's, let me try to put the pieces together that you've mentioned <laughs> as, as, as far as I understand them and we'll, we'll sort of see how we go from there. So there are a number of pieces of, um, science that you're appealing to. One is a, well, really, it's not a specific theory of quantum gravity. It's sort of a, a general result from a number of theories of quantum I gravity. I could that you're mentioning. reduce that now to a... So, so when we talk about quantum gravity, it's kind of a peculiar situation because there are people say the quantum gravity problem is not solved. And technically, that is true. That being said, there are things we know and there are things we don't know. And in the last like 10 years or so, we've made substantial headway in creating a generic f general frame of what we do know or what we think we know anyway and of that generic of that general frame um that the the current piece the like the the current most um advanced piece of the puzzle we put together that we think we know for certain is that space of emergence from entanglement and that would be the ds mirror correspondence and so the piece of physics that i'm putting into the argument actually is the that is the kind of the cutting edge of what we think we know so beyond that you have your string theory your loop quantum gravity your causal dynamical triangulations and so on and so forth and there's some overlap you even between those which you know there's things we don't know in that area but the piece that i'm giving you here is something that we think we do know and it it derives from i, I remember saw you in, in um when you're, you're discussing ips in your, your critique of ips you brought up the holographic principle and this is if you want a little, I mean, it's not necessary per se for this, but it might be helpful to kind of show you where it, it goes instead of kind of historical curiosity. We had the holographic principle, and that led to something known as the ER equals EPR correspondence. So you had uh, holography, as you know, you got like the surface of a black hole is the, the classic example. And the surface of the black hole has all the information describing the interior is stored in the surface. That's why it's a you know, hologram, as it were. You have... 3d uh, 2d representation of a 3d object and uh, so what they, they showed us there is a correspondence between a two-dimensional quantum field and a three-dimensional space-time and so from that they then had the thought Suskind and Maldacena had this thought of well what happens when you try to you see you have two entangled black holes you entangle the event horizons and they discovered astonishingly that those two black holes then cease to be black holes and these then become wormhole two ends of a wormhole the two wormhole mouse all of a sudden that's what happens when you plug you know entangled black holes into the holographic correspondence you end up with this weird situation where entanglement suddenly gives rise to wormholes and so they realize you know entanglement is you know you think of a wormhole like a stargate or something you have 
there's one Stargate mouth over here, one Stargate mouth on some other planet, and they're light years apart, yet in a certain sense they're at the same exact place because that's the whole idea of a wormhole, right? It's, it's two points in space that are kind of fused into a single point, and you, you jump across that one point, and you're suddenly light years away or whatever. So the idea then is, well, entanglement then defines location. And if you think about what space is, well, imagine an empty universe for a second, right? Like there's no particles, no matter, nothing, it's just pure black. I mean, even, even, I mean, you can't do this with physics, but just imagine that you could get rid of the zero point vacuum itself, right? So there's nothing, it's just empty void. Now find the center of that space. Can you do it? Doesn't make sense to ask the question, really, does it? Right? Because you'd have to. I mean, what are you what are you relating it to? And you you think, well, well, there's nothing in there to relate space to. You have to measure off infinity from both sides to get to the center. But half of infinity is also infinity, so the center point is literally infinitely far away from itself, and that kind of defeats the whole point of space, which is able to distinguish locations. And so, therefore, space is defined by location. And so, if you have location in turn defined by entanglement you can have this peculiar thing where space derives from entanglement. And that was, um, that's where we get the, the intuition that the insight that eventually led to the DS mirror correspondence last year of space. I'm emerging from entanglement. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> that's a clarification about what aspect here is, is relevant. Um, the, this postulate that we can understand space time as an emergent property of the degree of entanglement between different quantum systems. Um, and so you're claiming that um, this postulate, in, um, I was going to say entails, uh, I guess that's that's right. Th this, um, as long as we distinguish entails from entangles, <laughs> they sound <laughs> similar. Um, th so this entails that, uh, I think there's two words that you've used here. Um, one is emergent, that is that space-time is emergent from quantum entanglement, or you've also said quantum information. The other word that you've used is um, an illusion or unreal in some way. Now, um, you've mentioned a number of quotes from from physicists working on this area who who have said, I've, I've seen some of these in IP's videos, and I think some of yours as well, who do say that things like space or time and or space time is, is an illusion or is unreal. Um, now, I think that these are misstatements, um, or at least that they're, they're crude popularizations. I don't think that that is correct based on their own theories. I think that the correct term would be emergent or non-fundamental, which is something that they also say. So um, I, I think that this is important here because the, the question I think that we need to be thinking about is what what is the importance of, um, let, let's just suppose that the um, entanglement space-time postulate, as we said, is, is correct. Um, does it follow that space-time is sort of unreal? Um, and I'm not really sure that it does. And in fact, I'm not really sure why anyone says this because the fact well, that something is not fundamental in no way makes it unreal. Okay, well, okay, so two ways you can talk about this. There is, I mean, it depends what you mean by a realism. As you know, in philosophy, there are more than one type of the word. When you use realism, there are a variety of things people use to refer to. There's direct realism, indirect realism, there's physical realism and scientific realism. Um, space is still real in a scientific realist fashion, okay? Mm. You're, you're, there's an actual thing called space-time and you're you're using actual equations and things exist in that that space time. Okay. That being said, and this is, this is me saying this, I'm going to try and justify this a little bit. Um, that reality is no different than the reality of a space inside of a video game. I mean, the video game, it, it has an objective reality to it. I mean, it, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a real world. You wouldn't think of it as a real world, but it does have an objective reality in that, you know, I can play the video game. You can play the video game. You can have us playing the video game together, you know, massively multiplayer game or whatever. And we can find objects in that game, pick them up, move them across the screen or move them across the uh, the map of the, the, the game, etc. There's a reality there and you can study that reality with science and so on. But you would not think of it as real in the the sort of common everyday sense. I mean, in, in not, not just common everyday sense, but it's it's very specifically not real in the way that the space inside of a video game is not real. Now, yeah, well, it seems to me that the reason we describe the video game worlds as unreal is because that's not the world that we inhabit. Not the world we if, inhabit, if it, yes. So if it were the case that, I mean, it could be the case that the entire universe is a simulation in some sort of computer in another universe, right? This is mm -hmm. something that, uh, oh, what's his face? Foster. Um, 
yeah, Nick Bostrom has uh, has argued is is likely under under certain conditions, right? Um, now, irrespective of whether whether that is true or not, that's not the point uh, of mentioning it. Right. The point is that I would still like if the universe were a simulation, I would still say, well, it's still our universe; it's still real because it's right. the place where we live, right? And it's where everything happens. Um, right. It's just in that, that its ontological nature is different to which we had thing. It is a real thing in that sense, but the, the point is, is that it's not the. There is a level beneath it. Yeah, and that level beneath it is more real than our world, and that level does not have space in it. it, it it's that. That's the thing. Is that it, it's. I mean, if someone's living in a video, like uh, no, of course, I, I have my own. I, I think that I hold the Chinese room. I think that's a valid argument. So I think you may have heard the news recently about uh, Google's Lambda potentially being sentient and all that. Yes. Okay, so imagine you had uh, you you copied the Lambda program and you put them in uh, a very elaborate Sims game or No Man's Sky or something like that. You didn't tell them they were there, and they're actually exploring all these planets in No Man's Sky, and they're finding you know automatically generated stuff. They they would be moving around in that world just the way that we are in our world, and it would be literally just as real to them as this is to us, because it, it's it's you know. You could even have uh, one Lambda program name himself, you know, give him the name Johan Ratz and download all my memories. Another one named James Fodor and download your memories and give him your name, right? And we would be literally talking in that world and we'd be, it would be you saying that statement that this world is real to us because it's the world that all of the stuff that we happens in. I mean, it would, it would still be a valid statement in that computer game, right? Yeah, okay. So... I mean, yeah, at that point, it becomes similar to just a brain in a vat type argument. Um, it is, except that the difference here is that, I mean, yeah, in that sense, yeah, that, that, there I'm just doing philosophy. But what I want to get at is that the physics is a very curious situation where the physics is saying that not as a matter of philosophy, but as just as a matter of physics, the physics appears to tell us that we live in a world like that. And it doesn't mean it's a brain in a vat or in the matrix, you know, run by sentinels or whatnot. But it is a, it is that kind of a world, and the reason is is there there are independent physics reasons, completely nothing to do with philosophy, that suggest that. That's what I'm getting at. Well, yeah, I mean, in a sense, I I use the brain in a vat or the the the, um, the simulation hypothesis as analogies for the idea that our world could be, um, could be not fundamental, like entirely not fundamental, existing in like another universe of some sort. Um, I don't think that that's that is in some way analogous to um, the um, space-time emergent from in, uh, entanglement hypothesis, but in other ways, it's really not. There's no, there's no sort of deeper universe, uh, or at least there's no need to postulate some sort of deeper universe or like a creator or anything that mm, gives rise what? to the entanglement per se. It's a deeper level of reality that exists, um, that exists sort of um, outside. Uh, outside is not quite the right word, but um, uh, posterior to. Um, oh, sorry, anterior to uh, space time and from which space time emerges. But how is and that that's... different than a deeper level of reality? I mean, so you, you said like there's deeper level of reality, but then you basically said the same thing, just with different language. See what I'm saying? Like it's, it's. Well, so to me that, so uh, to me, it is, it is somewhat different. So, I mean, in the brain in the VAT scenario or in the um, simulation hypothesis scenario, there is another universe that may have completely different laws uh, to our own and in which, um, at least in both of those specific hypotheses, there is other intelligences that then sort of created our whole universe. Now, neither of those things is necessarily true under the um, the hypothesis that we're talking about. All it means is that space and time, which we might have naively thought of, like perhaps Newton did as sort of fixed fundamental substrates, are in fact not, but emerge from something deeper, some underlying quantum processes. I don't know that that has much of it. I mean, it's interesting, and it's certainly, if it's true, it certainly contributes to our understanding of the world, but to me, it, it doesn't have much in terms of like, um, I don't know, metaphysical or philosophical import more than understanding that an atom is not indivisible as we thought, but is can be divided into um, subatomic particles. Now, space is not fundamental and ultimate, but in fact is emergent from underlying quantum processes. I don't, I don't really see how there's any particular philosophical import from that. Uh, from that, I don't mind. know. I mean, it's where do you say that? Because I mean, I, I'm you. you you're 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 in philosophy and I'm in philosophy too, but I also have the background in physics. And so I kind of like I have this kind of weird situation where I'm trained both as a you know to think like a physicist and to think like a philosopher. And so I look at this from two angles, kind of stereoscopically, and it looks to me like it it's it actually does have a lot of import. Like it's, you know, I think 
you know, granted, this is not the most up to date motion of physicalism. And I, I'm going to distinguish physicalism from naturalism here. I know that people don't usually do that, but um, like he kind of, I think Kant was kind of pointing out that, you know, a physical or a material object you'd think of as occupying space. It's something that, you know, my computer is sitting in space. It has spatial extension. It, it lives in three dimensions and so on. Right. And so when you're saying space doesn't exist, like, and maybe it does exist, but there's some level of reality in which it doesn't exist, right? There's this deeper level. And so even if it exists at our level, there's this more fundamental level where it's not there. That's very profound because then you have this, uh, this situation where, you know, the entire ground of what you previously thought was being, which is, you know, this material reality, everything you thought of uh, as everything that we previously defined as material now no longer is material. So well, I think that that's your definition of materialism and so on. You can change it to like, say, you know, na and that's why I call myself a naturalist, by the way, is I, you know, all this stuff I see is having, you know, laws of physics backing it up. But um, everything that you previously thought of as material, it's no longer, you know, we're no longer thinking of it as it, it doesn't exist anymore. You might, you might, you might redefine material in some way and say, well, therefore, matter still exists because now matter is information but it's like i mean at that point it's either moving the goalposts or it's um kind of d engaging in the game of semantics to the point where it, like like i mean you know can i call myself a materialist idealist for example i mean i suppose under certain conditions i could if we if we go that the game enough at which point like what's the what's the point of even having a, a disagreement as it were well maybe there isn't i don't know but i i i guess i have a very different way i mean i I think that what you're talking about is really the way is really reflects a change in the way that we understood the material world that occurred with the quantum revolution. So prior to that, I mean, you're talking about Kant's notion um, of of material matter as occupying space um, right. in a sort of quite a cl classical way. I mean, that's 200 years out of date. I don't think materialists have thought like that, or at least they shouldn't be thinking like that uh, for they about 100 be, years yes. since the quantum revolution. We know that matter isn't like that. Um, well, that's, that's what the, I was that, saying. That's, if we, that's part of the well, problem. If I can just finish this point. Well, go ahead. Um, that's what I was saying about <clears throat> we used to think of atoms back in the 19th century as essentially like tiny billiard balls. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that that's completely wrong conception of an atom. An atom is divisible, and it's more like, a, particularly if we think of a subatomic particle, subatomic particles, excuse me, a smeared probability cloud, and we can talk about all the quantum mechanics behind that, which is really quite strange and confusing. Very different to how we used to think about um matter but what i would say is i don't and i don't think materialists should approach the subject with some sort of a priori um folk definition of matter which is like little billiard balls that take up space i approach it as well matter is whatever the best physics tells me that it is right um and so if the best physics and i'm not sure that we're actually there yet but let's put that aside if the best physics tells us to me that space and time is emergent from underlying quantum information well okay that's what space and time are like that's cool but that doesn't somehow undermine my commitment to materialism or that the notion that um that's what makes up reality it just changes my understanding of what it's like i guess then the question is is how would you define materialism well i don't unlike you i don't distinguish it from naturalism um so that might make some difference here but um i think i would define materialism as the view that everything that exists is material and i would say what is material well material is um, not something that we could define sort of pre-theoretically it is um, what our best science, science, particularly fundamental physics, tells us that material world is like. And so it can be contrasted with competing theories which say that there are non-material components to reality, such as traditional theism, um, mind-body dualists, um, people who believe in some sort of like non-physical karma or magical forces, uh, people who believe in abstract objects. So those are some contrasting views that I would say are non-material. Whereas okay. materialism rejects these and says that all that exists is material. Okay, so here's this kind of a problem then, right? And this is, you know, it's an interesting that you bring this up. But um, so the problem is, is that if you define it that way, you've heard of Hempel's dilemma, right? Uh, is this under determinism you're talking about? Uh, basically, what he's saying is, let's you want to explain that, that for the basically uh, Carl Hempel had this idea where you have, um, let's let's say how do you define physical you use the word physical rather than material but he said you know either physical is defined by our current physics or it's defined by some future you know hypothetical physics like perfectly complete physics but the problem is is he said we don't know how our future physics is going to evolve our future yeah, physics right. might involve such things as unembodied minds 
And so then the question is, is, well, if you defined physical this way, then you end up with this really weird situation where at some point down the line, you could end up with such a thing as a physical unembodied mind. It's like a, like an, a contradiction in terms in a sense. It's like, or maybe, you know, you go the other way and say, it's not a contradiction in terms, but at this point, like, what's the, you've blurred the line so far now that there's really no way you may as I well. I don't think I have blurred the line at all. Uh, no, no, so you, I would, have, you have it, but I'm saying like, like, say some future, like, like if we go down this route where you, you could, you could imagine a situation where the line gets blurred. Oh yeah, it's possible. I think that's extremely unlikely, but it's, well, it's that's, not that's the thing is actually, I think that it, given the current situation, the physics is actually extremely likely. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more into this and somewhat that I have more data to show you, by the way. Uh, which is well, we haven't got. Well, hang on, we haven't got to the mind part yet. We're just sort of working there from, the, from the, the physics, the, the physics part, part, and we're talking about what what follows from that about materialism. But I would just say the way I think about this is, I don't. In fact, I think it's a mistake to have some sort of a priori folk definition of uh, of matter or material, which we then test against the science, because that's almost certainly going to be wrong. I mean, right, it is wrong, right? right. Um, well, what we should do is um, take the best current science to say of... about the nature of matter, and that's what I understand as materialism to be. If one day it it that became it became the case, as you say, that the best science um, told us that there were um, disembodied minds or something, well, then I would believe in that, right? But then that would become part of the materials paradigm, right? And then there would be this weird fusing. And I, I mean, it, you know, philosophy would be up in arms, right? But I mean, yes, yeah, that's, that what would said, that's, that's what I said is you'd end up with this. It's really possible that that could happen, right? But I'd end up agreeing and you know, be like, I, I'm I mean, saying if the facts I, change, I, I change my mind. Like, I don't see that as a problem. That. Yeah, that, that that's cool. It's actually, it was, that's why I wanted to have a discussion rather than a debate because I thought some of this evidence yeah, might sure. actually um, make you like, like, wait a minute, I could see this happening, kind of thing. Like it's it's. So um, the issue with this prima facie is, and now this is just at a philosophic level. We'll we'll get to the quantum cognition and the IIT later and the conscious realism and all that, but um, the. If you have information, everything's made of information at bottom. I mean, you think of the, the, what's the very first, and of course, this is using folk psychology again, but we're just going to do this, or, you know, folk philosophy, or, you know, again, just to, I know you kind of went off against doing that, but we'll just do it again because I'm going to show you as a, a conceivability argument here. Um, if you have everything made of information in that fashion, there is nothing at all implausible about that information being mental. I mean, the very first conception that we had the very first idea of what information was that we had you know before we we got into like a hard mathematical definition of information it was it was due to you know we define it as thing having mental properties you know right. ideas are information uh percepts are information etc yeah. and so the issue then is is if this is information and it's it's fundamentally behaving as you know information in a certain sense it's it's you know it's not um it's degrees of freedom that are relating things, but you know, the first one we had is mental. There's no sense in positing this, you know, firstly, there's no sense in positing this second kind of physical reality, you know, physical information that's distinct from mental information. You can just collapse them and say, well, there's just one type of information. It's physical, mental, it's the same thing. But then number two, the question is, is, and this is almost like a, it's almost kind of like a, a Bostrom simulation type of spinoff, right? Where you, you know, we live in the, the what, what's the chance of us living in the one real reality rather than the, the 99 million, you know, simulated realities, right? Well, this is just instead of 99 million to one, it, it's one to one. You could very well be living in a universe that is made of mental information rather than non-mental. Because, you know, it might end up that mental actually equals material in the end of the day. But well, we'll use the word non-mental to distinguish the mental so we don't run into that problem. But it's going to behave exactly as though we're living in a mental role. I mean, you couldn't tell a difference and it, it, it looks as though it behaves like, you know, like let's say that it's not actually a conscious mind. Let's say it's something like a, a naturalistic version of a artificial intelligence, having a dream or something that's not actually conscious or whatnot. It's, it's a, you know, a non-mental substrate, but it behaves in every respect that you would imagine a, a dreamer to behave like. Like the interior, the physics behaves like the way you would expect a, a dream world to behave is what I'm getting at. And and at that point, I would wonder, does that kind of make you wonder or make you sus uh, suspect that maybe we're a whole lot closer to this, you know, convergence points than you might realize? Um, yeah, so 
let's uh, maybe it'll be helpful to talk a bit about information since that's where you're going here. So if, if we say that, say, space time is emergent from um, quantum entanglement, which can be described in terms of information, um, and quantum states generally can be described in terms of information content, um, then we might think of as information. We might think of information as fundamental in some sense, and some physicists and philosophers have made this argument. Um, now, to me, this is a little bit hard to understand. Um, I think I think of information certainly when we're talking about it in the physics context. And you, you mentioned before that there's uh, just earlier that there's a difference between information as used in sort of physics or information theory and information as we talk about it more colloquially where that's just sort of like an idea right or well they're not there's a difference but it's not like um they're not i'm going to put this it's a difference in on the physics side it's the the information you talk about colloquially you can also translate into the physics side but it's like the it's kind of the difference between a well, uh, sort kindergarten of. understanding and a high school understanding. That difference between I don't I don't entirely agree with that, right? Because the way we think colloquially about information is is actually quite hard to formalize in many contexts. So let me give an example of that. Um, okay. Information, as formalized say, in information theory and the way it would be understood in physics as well, is really a measure of entropy. And so, if I presented you with um, just a random assortment of pixels, just like black and white, um, with with no structure to it, there's a lot of information in that because it's extremely random and you can't compress it really very much mm -hmm. um because um each sort of each pixel needs to be described independently of the others to, to put it very crudely right whereas as a person i would say there's no information there it's just noise right so there's mm -hmm. actually quite a big distinction whereas something would say as having a lot of information which is maybe an image of a person um that maybe could be compressed a lot because there's actually a lot of symmetry and regularity there so there's mm -hmm. i think actually quite a big difference between the way we naively well, or psychologically think of information and the way it's described it, in terms of physics or in terms of i mean because you could see uh, uh you know if someone really was, you know, like you see, you had a, uh, a a kid with Aspergers, you know, or you know, well, there was a type of the the the, the like, not Aspergers, it's, I think the savant type, right? Where there's like they're very autistic, but at the same time they're like hyper intelligent. They have like they can memorize a, a phone book or whatnot. You know what I'm talking about, right? The kind of savant syndrome. So you have like say a, a savant kid, and he's looking at a you know, there's a, a a frozen picture of static, right? And he might actually say, you know, in a colloquial sense, oh, there is information there. There's this little black pixel and this little gray pixel and this little white pixel. And he's going to memorize all little pixels like you would, you know, stuff on a phone book. Well, then that's all still on a colloquial level. And he'd say, well, what what defines that? Well, the gray is different than the black and this is located in a different spot than this. And I would say it's defined by differences, right? It's a measure of differences, right? And that's like- Well, yes, that that's how it's formalized. I would say that it would be, I mean, that's a savant perhaps would say something like that. I'm, I'm not really sure, but that's sort of why we call them a savant, right? Because most people don't really uh, perceive a visual scene right. like that. But and if, if we're presented is... with a lot of what looks to us noise, we would say there's no real information here. This is just static, right? right when you turn on your TV the, and it's just static. When you ask the question of like, say, you don't like say the, that this is meaningful. Yeah, well, that's the, that the thing is meaningful then becomes it, it's subjective to the person. Like, you know, you yeah, but so have... is information. That's what I'm saying here. When we think about right, it in a psychological I, context. What I'm getting is that even the context. person who has the more normal view, right? Like, you know, well, there's no information in the, in the noise. There's information between these two faces because we can tell this person has blonde hair, this person has dark hair, this one has, you know, blue eyes, this one has green eyes or hazel eyes, etc. Yeah. Well, that's information by a colloquial center, but you can see that's already on kind of a spectrum with the savant because, well, what defines that information? Well, the green eyes is different than the hazel eyes. There's another measure. Yes, of difference there, again. there is some commonality to the constructs, which is why uh, I, I think that they use the same term, right? But I, I, my point is that there is massive differences between the way we, as, like as human beings, think about and process information and the, the way that it's used in a physics context. And I think that there's uh, a lot of confusion at the popular level when, when this term is used. Let me give another example, which actually might be more helpful for our audience at least. Okay. So if I, um, and this relates to my own research where I, I um, look at um, uh, natural language processing. So if I if I present you with a book that has text in it, like any kind of book really, and you read it and like, okay, there's information here, it's telling me stuff. Now suppose that I scramble all of the characters in the text. So the characters are the same, but they're in just in random orders. Now, um, if it's been well randomized, the randomized form will actually have more information in it because it's more random. It has a higher entropy in the in the like the physics in, um, information theory uh, way of thinking about it. But a human being would not say that there's the text is now more informative. They would say it's meaningless. It's gibberish. It doesn't tell me anything. Right? There's no information here in in the psychological sort of 
a folk context. And again, that's because we process meaning differently. We have a way of thinking about and storing information, again, in the psychological sense, that's very different from the just maximum entropy sort of way that we talk about it in physics. I, I don't think it's actually that I'm helpful to use the same word. A, I'm going to draw an exception to this. And that is the average person. I mean, that that is a valid point. But now think about the computer age for a second. And you say you had a, um, you know, an average person will look at, say, the raw code of a computer. And you're asking, what do you think of that? He may not get anything meaningful out of it. He will definitely say that's information, though. Yes, but but that just uh, further substantiates my point, because the entropy of any sort of structured computer code is going to be lower than random text. Random text, will all, like given the same number of symbols, right. will always have the maximum entropy and therefore the most information in a information physics context. That's what well, information describes in the a, physics context. That, that's true, but to someone who doesn't have a background in computer science, they'll look at the code and they'll not be, I mean, a, a skilled coder will be able to look at that and say, I know what this program is doing. It's, it's very highly organized. This is you know, definitely not random. The average person will look at it, though, and they will see it as no different than the static noise. Yeah, because they're not able to interpret they're it. They're not and able to interpret it. That's precisely what I'm talking about. There's no notion of interpretation in uh, information theory as, as it regards to physics. You don't interpret the information. It's just the, the measure of entropy, the measure of the number of states or the disorder of something. That's very different to our notion of being able to understand the meaning or interpret something. And again, so I, I think that that's right, why the notion is actually quite the, distinct. Let's go back to the savant kid again. Here's an example. Now, yes, it's a big bunch of random noise. You have a black pixel, a gray pixel, a white pixel, you know, different shades of black and gray and white and so on in between. Um, the point is, is that each one of those pixels, if you want to get super specific about it, each one of those has meaning. I mean, black is distinct from, has a distinct meaning from gray. Now, yes, it's not going to give you the kind of colloquial, like it's not going to give you the day-to-day -day kind of information or meaning you want, but the average person will, if they're asked, depressed about it, you know, with no background in computer science or information theory or physics or whatnot, they'll still say, Black is meaningful. Black is a meaningful concept that is distinct from gray. And so there is meaning between these two pixels. And, you know, and then if there's meaning between two pixels, there's meaning between a million pixels. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't really agree that that's how people really think about it. If you that's not how they think about it, but if they, if they were pressed to, if they were pressed to, you know, ask, you know, like someone writes, really ask the question, let's zoom in on this photograph. What do you see here? I mean, yeah, they'll say, they say there's this pixel and that pixel, but does it mean anything? Does it convey any information to me? I think people would typically say no. Anyway, the point is not to press them to it. And if you press them to it, I think they would then say yes. Well, because... They may make some sort of judgment like that. The point I'm making, though, is not exactly how people would respond in that kind of weird scenario. The point is to dis differentiate the way that minds represent and store information and process it and the way that we uh, that information is uh, described and used in in fundamental physics and the way i and, and that's in that is basically as a measure of entropy the measure of the number of microstates uh, that a state can be in and i understand that to be purely like very physical uh, is in it describes how many physical states a system can be in um and i don't really see reducing um say space time to information states as as somehow non-physicalizing it. It, it. I see that as extremely physical because you're literally talking, at least the way I interpret it, and this does being a bit of philosophy, and right. as, as descriptions of the number of possible configurations of a physical system. Well, that's the thing. I, I don't see that as somehow non-physical. Yeah, I, I don't think at that point we're really disagreeing. It's just that we're, we're using different... I, 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 when people use the word physical like that, I simply use it as natural, which is... I, I guess it the, may not whether, whether or not it's natural or not is not my point. My point is I don't see anything mental there. The, the sense that you see, well, it's information, so that links to the mental. I don't see that because the way the mental works, at least in, for humans, appears to be extraordinarily different to how we're talking about information in the underlying physical concept, um, which that is just actually brings up a completely different, different physical point. configurations of systems. A completely different point that I want to, before we get to the quantum cognition, I want to I wanna get to that as well because there's okay, something sure. about that that's fishy. That is interesting. As someone from a physicalist point of view, there's something very interesting here. Um. Obviously, uh, I believe. I think you mentioned you believe some kind of emergentism, right? Uh, about what? <laughs> the mind. About the mind. Sorry. Oh, the mind. Um, well, the mind They're, emerges from the activity of the brain, or brain, something okay. like that. Yeah, so yeah. functionalism. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. therefore, you also probably believe in multiple instantiability, right? I mean, you can have multiple, multiple realizability. Yes. Yeah. So there'd be different physical substrates that could realize the same. You mind. could have an AI doing the same thing, for example. Theoretically, or... yes. Okay. So. 
there is Paul Davies who's on Closer to Truth, and he brought this point up, and he said, you know, if that's the case, you could instantiate it on any information system whatsoever. And this is where, when we get to Tononi's research with cognitive science, you know, cognitive science, he actually does start to blur those two, um, those things he didn't want to blur before. He starts to blur them, and he points out, well, there's information in the brain. Well, information in the brain is no different than information in a thermostat in principle. And so he actually comes to the conclusion that the thermostat has some kind of consciousness, even if it's not like our conscious, like some kind of, you know, very low grade, super primitive panpsychist kind of conscious the thermostat has, right? And his model comes to this conclusion. And this is you now the most popular model of cognitive science in the world right now. And he he's actually blurring them. And he's saying, because you have this multiple real, multiple realizability problem a situation it should appear you know there's nothing in principle distinguishing information in a brain from information in a computer or information in a thermostat or information in a you know a cell or for that matter information beneath space time yeah, so I think the problem with that argument from my point of view is the in principle line because I think I might agree depending on what you mean by in principle but that just seems to me that qualification seems to make the whole statement meaningless. I mean, what is the in principle difference between, say, a plant and an animal? Like in principle, if a plant, I don't know, started moving around and and uh, eating uh, carnivorous, I mean, there are some carnivorous plants and uh, I don't know, it stopped photosynthesizing. I mean, in principle, it would be an animal, right? Well, if you change all the things that make it different, then I, I guess it would be, right? But the point is that the way that information processing occurs in a brain is highly specialized and specific to, to serving certain functions. And so the in principle just seems to be uh, pushing all those okay. to the side as so far as I can tell. So we have to get into the in principle then. And the so in principle what, what does that here, really do for us? Well, the in principle here is it's not because, I mean, you can have, um, you know, you can have someone who has lost most of their cognitive functions and they still have a consciousness, right? Or you uh, can have, well, you know, possibly hydra. to some extent, yeah. You can have a hydra, you know, like a little, you've seen little hydras under the microscope or whatnot, or like in a, you know, magnifying oh, glass. Oh, that sort of. <laughs> yeah, those, those, <laughs> little, those, little, those, little, those cute little pond animals that look, Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Not, not like a, a snake with multiple. That's what know. I thought you meant. I was like, no, 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 I haven't seen those under the microscope. <laughs> I don't know They're what really microscope cool, you've been looking at. They're really cool. We got these, when I was growing up, we would get these NASCO, I was homeschooled, we got these NASCO catalogs, and they would buy all kinds, of, we, my parents would buy all kinds of science equipment, and I would frequently for Christmas request uh this is stupid getting these little organisms out of the catalog and they a little culture of like green and yellow hydra as well as both planaria and so on daphnia anyway um they have some kind of i mean they're they're multicellular organisms they're you know closest relatives are like jellyfish and corals they don't have a centralized brain they do have a nervous system though and they do be they you know arguably they have some kind of it's nowhere near our kind of consciousness it doesn't have any kind of the functions and they don't have a brain properly I mean, they may have a brain but the brain if you want to call it that is literally distributed all around their body okay but the point is is they still have a very basic nervous system and they have consciousness or you know ar arguably have conscious even of a primitive fashion and they can they can respond to their environment they can avoid danger they can hunt things they, they can move around at will if they, they choose to. And they behave like conscious organisms, even though they're not. Well, it, it might so, be necessary to clarify what we mean by conscious here. because That's that where we're, that's, that's where I wanted to go with this. So do you so mean conscious. having a subjective state, like qualia? Is that exactly. what you're referring to? Exactly. So it's first state, person yeah. versus third person. Well, I, I doubt that Hydra have uh, qualia in that sense. But obviously, we, I mean. I, I don't know. I mean, I that. think I, maybe this is just a bias. I think that even protozoa do, but I think that whatever they have is extremely primitive. Like it's there, but it's like almost like a just like a, 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 a very very brute um, recognition of first person state kind of thing. It's well, not even it's not self reflective in any sense, but it, it's. They well, do possibly. Have I think that's unlikely, but I, I won't rule it out completely. But I, I guess the point that I would make is, um, I, I don't think that. The, the, the fact that you can describe like a thermometer in terms of information states, uh, it doesn't follow that any particular system has has qualia, right? Because we can understand qualia as being due to a certain configuration of the internal components, a certain type of processing, whatever it is exactly. Um, right. And it doesn't follow that any system that conveys information or stores information, which is any physical system, by the way, uh, it doesn't follow that any system is functionally characterized by the in that in that way. And so it doesn't follow that any physical system will, can have qualia. 
but just I guess like not every physical system we, can okay, photosynthesize because okay, well, you, you, you need the components to do that. How would you demark? And we're actually going to get to that because uh, I, there is a, a this ties. Uh, you know, we're getting closer. To the, I, I see this this conversation inching closer in relevance to the quantum cognition stuff, which is kind of funny. We're not quite there yet, but I do see it inching in this direction. It's kind of funny. Oh, good. Um, we'll get there in the end. <laughs> yeah, we'll get there in the end. Um, so you have. I guess the question is, is at what point would like, what would distinguish a non qualia information state from a quality and like from a third person perspective, it, it seems very almost arbitrary in a sense. Well, uh, other, I, other than like kind of an empirical post hoc approach, but I mean, that's, that works, but it's not really philosophically satisfactory. Do, do you mean, how could we tell if a state had qualia? Is that what yeah, I mean, so you have information pattern one versus information pattern two versus information pattern three. Yeah. How do you distinguish? Like, I mean, one's a brain state. I mean, like, say, say you've never seen a brain in your life, right? You, you don't, you know, you're a person in the jungle who's raised in the jungle. You have no idea what neuroscience is. You're, you're completely new to all this stuff. And you're given a brain and a computer and a thermostat and something else in a laboratory. Say, say you're a genius, though, despite this, you're completely isolated. You see all this stuff. How do you know that one of these items, when processing information, corresponds to a quality of state and the other one does not? Well, that's a very good question. The short answer is, I don't think we know at the moment, but I can say a little more than that. So first of all, I would say that even if even if we identify qualia with information processing, there's still going to be an argument as to the, the form that that takes. Like informated, sorry, integrated information theory doesn't just say information equals consciousness. It's the way that it's the integrated processing. It's the integration. Well, it's and specifically so, what it does is it, it, it's information that is like, it, it's reflexive. It, it's contained to a single system such that all the elements of the system uh, relate to yeah, each other. But, yeah, yeah. So, but the point I was making there is regardless of whether that's correct or there's some other theory of information that links it to qualia, there's still a theory that describes how that works, right? And you have to then, right. like, how do you justify that theory? Because what you can't do as a first person uh, observer is transmognify into a different system and still retain your identity and then observe the qualia within that system. Like this is, this comes back to uh, thought experiments like Thomas Nagel. What is it like to be a bat? You can't I mean, get into the thermostat basically. You, you, yeah. You can't get into the thermostat. You can't get into the bat, right? I mean, you could be a I mean, bat. Then, does then you'd be a bat, right? Is conscious, but he's, so, well, you know. What I'm saying is what we can never do. It seems to me at least is um, jump become a different system, observe what the quality of that is like, and then jump back and and compare it to our theory. So any theory of qualia is going to have to basically postulate on the basis of an extrapolation as to, look, here's what I think uh, the quality will be like, or here's how I think it relates to something objectively um, observable, whether that's information or not. Now, I don't think that it's information per se. I, I'm not necessarily sold on that, but it, but it could be. But the, the, the point is that I, I, that's not going to be a unique problem to a functionalist view or, or to any other view. Like any view of consciousness is going to have to say, look, we're going to extrapolate on the basis of something that's externally observable because we can't get into the internal first person view of something else. So I would say the best we can do is just observe the physical substrates of consciousness and, and try to um, make the best judgments we can on uh, assumptions like, well, if I think that I'm consciousness and I think that that is a product of the way my brain works, then systems that have a, a similar functionality that is structured similarly, presumably also have uh, a similar first person experience. And I would sort of go from there, right? Uh, I think that really that's what inform integrated information theory is doing as well. It, it takes certain approach to that that involves information. Um, but I don't think that's fundamentally different. It, it's an extrapolative approach based on it's certain not, but it, it, What it points out, though, is that it, it's, it, it, it recognizes the fact that there is this um, kind of – that it, it, it recognizes the fact that it's hard to differentiate between one that's conscious and one that's not conscious. And that's why you have – Tononi saying that such things as quantum entanglement and thermostats have consciousness. Like, you I mean, he says in the theory, you know, like, I see in his footnote, he says entanglement counts as integrated information. And by the way, a thermostat also has integrated information of its own right. It's. Yeah, well, I it mean, may not I would be just, our qualia, but it's. I would just regard that as, I mean, I. A thermostat has integrated information. I'm not sure exactly how that fits with integrated information theory, but. The, I, I've seen it. I've seen it in some of the, the, the popular. Um, renditions of integrated information theory like presentations of it it's it's, it's the same well i don't claim to be an expert in that I, I that doesn't seem right to me but irrespective of that the point is i just i i don't think that i, I just don't, i don't think that's plausible i don't think that's a plausible theory of consciousness and of course you know um i don't have one to offer although it, it seems to me that it requires something like a human nervous system um 
that could be that could just be our bias, right? Maybe there's something that's very different that doesn't have that. Um, but um, a Martian, from, like from what we know at the moment, in terms of what we know at the moment, uh, it seems that it requires something like that. Uh, and um, I think we just need a lot more research into the neural correlates of consciousness before we can really understand the functionality that it requires. And I'm not really convinced by information counts, but even if I was right, it, it still wouldn't follow that a thermometer has qualia, right? Because it depends on the way that that information is processed, the way that it's instantiated, things like that. And remember that if information is just a configuration of physical states, which is how I understand it, um, then th there's not, I, again, I don't see this as in any way conflicting with a, a physicalist picture. Um, right. Well, the way, way, the way you it. defined physicalism, I'm fine with that. And it's, it's, well, I guess what I'm getting at is if that's the case, I, it's kind of funny because I, I, I troll people with this and it's, it's, I've trolled atheists with this, but I've also trolled certain religionists with this who don't like from the flip side, they, they get kind of irritated when I start to blur the uh, the natural supernatural boundary the way that I do. It's like there was one time I made a video where I, it was like it was a completely spe it was I mean it was using solid physics, but it was like a kind of a thought experiment video of let's try and replicate a miracle with science, right? Hmm. And I had the whole thing worked out like like what would this entail, and then do we have the ingredients for this in the physics? Oh yes, we do. And here's how you put them together, and voila, you have a miracle, right? I mean, it's not a and there were, there were certain people there were complaining, like the IP shared this on his, his Facebook page. And there were like people saying, Johanna is, is uh, louding uh, mankind and kind of demeaning miracles to this thing that like, uh, you know, he's he, kind of being irreverent towards the, the topic by making it, um, you know, within the realm of science or whatnot. <laughs> um, so let's see here. It's the point I was going to get to. Maybe we should get into the quantum cognition, the correlates. Okay, well, so I think that's where we're sort going. Of bad at so at now, yeah. here's the thing with this: is that when we study consciousness, and just keep this in mind, because we're not. I mean, you can respond to this if you want, but you know, before we we kind of go further into this, um, to, to see what we the model I want to look at. When you study consciousness, there is this issue of people usually either study only the hard problem or the easy problem. And I think you have to kind of put them in kind of a Hegelian tension with each other, like try and like, they're, they're, you have to take certain a priori considerations into account, see how well a certain theory matches that, and then see how well that theory also is able to match to, you know, the actual empirical data. Right. And so this is a really goofy problem where it, I mean, it is why they call it the, you know, the problem of not just the hard problem, but like the, this is why there is philosophy of mind. This has been a mystery for thousands of years of how to relate it to, and they don't seem to, they don't seem to play along too well, but I do have some ideas now um, on how, some clues on how this happens. And it would actually kind of, it would, it would match uh, why you think, you know, the evidence that would suggest that the mind is emergent from my point of view, the mind can't possibly or mentality can't possibly be emergent for due to epistemic constraints but i can understand um you know why the evidence appears to suggest that and i also can use the physics to offer a alternative explanation to that would actually match the data that would you know seem to suggest the mind is you know this emergent structure right you have a bunch of neurons together they have to all uh, there's a, a friend of mine alan aldrich who is dealing with this thing called um I can't remember the name of the thing off the top of my head, but it's it's a it's a model of con uh, kind of a solution to the easy problem, as it were. And it was discussing um, basically every time there's a cognitive state change, the entire brain changes in some, or not entire brain, but like big sections of the brain changes like holistically. So you have like you know this thought happens, and then suddenly, well, this neuron changes, but it's not just this neuron; it's this pattern of this whole web of neurons changes simultaneously as like one big holistic whole. And that's a thought change. And wow. um, this would explain, and that would appear to be emergent because I mean, you have, you know, what you're looking at sort of this reductionist point of view, which is a, you know, as trained as a scientist, you know, in, in a scientific age, we're, we're used to like trying to break stuff down to little bitty parts. And well, of course, that's emergent. There's all these little parts, right? I'm going to suggest something else. But before we get that, we got to get into quantum cognition because now you'll see how this kind of builds up. Okay. <laughs> um, so I saw when you're discussing quantum cognition in, in the critique video, you had this thing where you, you were saying, uh, well, IP was saying the mathematics, I wish you had gone a little more into the detail with the, with this actually, because this is, uh, I think this would be defended much better. Um, the, 
the argument, of course, was is that, well, the mind behaves with this kind of math, quantum mechanics behaves with this, you know, can we just model this math? Well, that, that's a really kind of poor correlation, right? I mean, on face value, and you said the example you gave was kind of funny because you used, well, this, you know, this area can be used with differential equations, can be described with differential equations, and that area over here can be described by differential equations, so therefore they're linked, right? And, you know, those two areas, for all we know, could be uh, meteorology and atomic physics, which have next to nothing to do with each other, right? The thing with that is, though, is that it's it actually turns out that it's kind of funny to use differential equation as the example, because in this particular case, it does happen to be differential equations, but not just any differential equation. It has to be not just like differential equations as a category. Um, the mathematics you're using to describe consciousness now, specifically fuzzy logic and um, like indecision, it's being modeled with a very specific differential equation. And that differential equation shows up somewhere else in the sciences. And as far as I know, it shows up in only one other location in all of science. And guess what it might be? Uh, what the equation is? Uh, you're not talking about Schrodinger's equation, are you? It's Schrodinger's equation. They're modeling thoughts, like the indecision process, like with, with Schrodinger's equation. Well, and yeah, that's coming, the approach of quantum cognition. Yeah, it's quantum cognition. It's literally, so it's not just like, you know, we're using similarish math or math that is like in a same kind of category that could be applied to X, Y, and Z other fields. It's literally the exact same equation that's being used to uh, predict human cognitive behavior. This originally started in economics. They had this field called quantum economics, and they were using the Schrodinger equation to try and predict the stock market, and they were, we were successful with it. And then they realized, well, what is the stock market fundamentally? And you have a bunch of individual traders who are on the floor making individual decisions whether to buy or sell. And so what you're calling quantum economics is not really about economics. It's about human decision-making behavior, right? Which then has more to do with cognitive science than it does have to do with economics. And then they realize, oh, this is not just economics. This applies to cognition in general. And so it's, it's very curious because, I mean, when you think about that for a second, that's that's – I mean, it could be a coincidence, but the chances of it, it seems very, it looks like it's a clue. And I'm giving you an example from the history of physics as to why this is a clue. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a guy named Theodore Kaluza, okay? And he was screwing around with Einstein's equation. He's a mathematician, and as mathematicians do, they will take mathematics in places that are not motivated by any kind of physical consideration. They're just pure, you know, playing around in sort of hypothetical land, right? So he decides, let's try and model Einstein's general relativity in five dimensions, four space, one of time, right? And just see what comes out, right? And he discovered something very, he, he saw the result and he's like, oh my goodness. And he went and immediately emailed, you know, email back then, but he mailed, a wrote a letter to Einstein and um, there was a correspondence and we're not exactly certain if it leads to anything, but it, well, it did lead to something. We know for a fact it led to something because that something is extremely famous right now. It's something that's called super string theory. But we don't know if it's, it's you know, literally describing reality, but it is definitely a clue that was so profound that it led everyone to wonder if there was something actually going on there. It led to something called Kaluza Klein theory. What we discovered was a four-dimensional treatment of Einstein's equations actually replicates Maxwell's equations. And so he was wondering, is electromagnetism curvature of four of five dimensional space time, much the way that gravity is curvature of four dimensional space time? And so, I mean, not to say that literally is the case, but it, the clue was so profound that it warranted a lot of people to think that it may very well be the case that electromagnetism is curvature of five dimensional space time. And then while we're at it, um, due to certain details of the math, you have to have 10 dimensions because you have a only like three and 10 dimensions or three and seven dimensions have inner curl products. It's a, it's a math thing. But um, as a result of this, they then had this whole thing with super string theory of let's describe all the forces in terms of vibrations of little, you know, objects in, or space time objects in 10 dimensions. So this is an example of when this kind of mathematical coincidence shows up, it's not just a coincidence. It's a, this is a this is very, at least very likely a clue to a much deeper insight. Uh, now, the second thing I want to say about this is that there is another. If it is like say it's just a coincidence, right? Now, the brain, under normal belief, is a classical system, right? 
So if it's storing information, it should be storing it the way a classical computer should. If you do that, there is a specific problem that shows up with um, anything that deals with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, not just, you know, any math, but specifically something that has a superposition principle built into it. And that is, is you can't just then take uh, that particular type of math and model it. I mean, you could, but you run into this humongous problem if you do, of trying to model it classically. And that is, is it's the Feynman Universal Simulator problem, also known as the qubit unpacking problem, which IP, I don't know, did IP even, did he talk about this at all with you? It kind of shows up in a different context. We call it the qubit unpacking problem. In my videos, I think he might have used it the same. It's also Richard. Yeah, Feynman. I think he mentioned it in one of his videos. I don't think we discussed it. Basically, what's going on is you have an, a quantum bit. You have a superposition of states, right? It's one and zero at the same time, or many ones and many zeros. Well, if you want to put that on a classical computer, the classical computer doesn't run on qubits. you got to take each one of those superposed states in a single qubit. You've got to put them all out into individual bits. And so the problem then is that you're going to then have this problem where anything that you do on a, you know, for the same reason that a, a quantum computer runs so much faster than the classical computer, anything you do in the quantum computer, if you want to simulate a quantum computer or a qubit or, you know, any kind of quantum computation on a classical system, you're going to have a problem where the system, the classical system is going to then need exponential requirements for um, information storage, as well as it's going to have exponential slowdown problems. So yes, you can unpack all of those qubits into individual states in, in classical bits and you can then process them all as though they were a qubit the problem is is your computer is going to you know for each individual new superposition you add your computer is going to have massive slowdown problems and it, it, it's it's not going to be feasible to be doing that it's like and then also what's the point right i mean you have say the brain's classical why would it go all the trouble to then try and replicate this quantum fuzzy behavior you know when you could just you know you're modeling it like a a classical computer which is what they were trying to do for a long time you reach this conclusion of well if it's a classical computer you know it behaves like that then you have this um you know we should be like say, say what's your what's here's an example i love doing this uh, what's your favorite ice cream probably vanilla what's your second favorite well i don't know strawberry maybe okay so you go to the freezer door there's vanilla and strawberry right and if you're the Terminator, maybe you see how the Terminator thinks on, you know, the Terminator movies, right? You'll go, or maybe the TX, she'll go and she'll, like, process down the individual, um, you know, selections he or she can make, right? And then Terminator's going to then, like, strawberry, pulls the door out, he closes the door. It's like, it's a snap instant decision, right? It's like, it takes as long as to where it's to compute it, and it's like almost instantaneous, right? Whereas when you do it, you don't really do that, do you? I mean, you might do that under certain conditions, but most of the time you're going to stand there with the freezer door open for a second. Like, do I want vanilla? Do I want strawberry? Maybe a little bit of both. And you're, you're kind of like waffling. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, it's going to be vanilla today. And you you go and you pull it back out, right? Well, that, if you notice that actually, what does that sound like to you from a completely different point of view? I'm not sure what. Trainer's cat is dead and alive no. until it's one or the other. It's vanilla or strawberry until it's one or the other. Yeah, I understand that's how certain decision making has, has been modeled. So let's um let's try to sort of clarify where we're at at the moment. So your your argument is that uh there are a number of applications of formal the formalisms of quantum mechanics to understand certain cognitive processes. So this is probably called quantum cognition. Yeah. Um and this gives these successful applications give us reason to think that the mind is fundamentally a quantum system is that correct accurate? and this was not because this is this is a very new field there are some i actually just released a video on this this last week um it's kind of exciting because i mean when when was your when was your talk with ip on the digital physics argument i forget oh i don't know six months ago maybe okay i mean you might have not have been that, updating I, this, I mean this was a very obscure reference and i think that i mean i i found it when i was doing research for my paper and i was like oh this is really cool turns out there is actually some experimental studies on quantum cognition right now and they are very into because i mean i mean you could always say maybe it just is that nature happened to pick the trading equation right for both quantum mechanics and human thought right and maybe there's some we don't know what is some explanation for why 
the human brain doesn't have is happening to use this and doesn't use this, you know, has this exponential slowdown problem, et cetera, when it should be behaving classically. Maybe there's some some explanation we don't know for why we can get around the famous universal simulator problem, right? However, um, what's interesting though is that now we have some experiment, very hard experimental data, uh, two sets of experiments actually that point to a direct link between quantum mechanical behavior, you know, quantum mechanical properties and cognitive behavior. And obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, hypoth quantum mind hypotheses, like, you know, Hameroff had his whole um, qubit, uh, the qubits and microtubules idea. Then you had Stuart Kaufman with his poised realm. There was uh, Beck and Eccles, I think it was as far back as the 80s, they were suggesting there was quantum tunneling across uh, dendrites, you know, synaptic barriers and so on, or dendrite barriers across the synapses. And every, like, you know, a couple of years, you're, you have some new researcher coming out with a new hypothesis as to where the the quantum mind mechanism might be right whereas this it's not saying that we found a new mechanism where the we're not there's not like a proposal for a new mechanism so i want to make that clear this is not just you know, some random guy coming with oh we think we know where it is now like just you know it, it, they sometimes discover things interesting like they actually did find qubits and microtubules but it's uncertain that it's necessarily related to consciousness it it could be or it could just be another dead end but um what they found here was not a dead end. It was rather there was certain compounds were that they were physically able to isolate the fact this is quantum mechanical properties were causing cognitive changes. And the first was with lithium isotopes in rats. So as you know, with chemistry, uh, an isotope is, you know, it's the same element as another element of its same type, but it has a different number of neutrons, right? So in this case, you had lithium six and lithium seven. And um, the exact same valence electrons, and so therefore they have the exact same chemical properties, right? So you feed lithium-6 to some rats and lithium-7 to some other rats, and you have this kind of peculiar situation where, I mean, if it's chemical properties that's influencing their behavior, I mean, logically, it's, it's not going to change the chemistry one bit. So therefore, if it's a chemical reaction to their consciousness, between their, you know, is a brain is a, a big neurochemical machine. It's not, it shouldn't change anything cognitively. But it turns out, though, that the lithium-6, the the rats were behaving like they're crazy, right? They were, they were um, they, not crazy, but they were like, they're super attentive parents. They were, the, the Matthew Fisher, who's the guy looking into this, they called them helicopter rats. He was, they would pull the, 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 the pups back into the, uh, the nest as quickly as they fell out, and they would watching the kids like a hawk basically whereas you have the the rest of the lithium seven they didn't care much about the kids at all they sort of let them die started cannibalizing some of them and then the other one this is a more recent one this is 2018 this is what i just did my my um recent video on is uh the xenon isotope experiments they had one with this was with four isotopes and uh it's actually kind of funny there was a um, remember i said i had some problems with some religionists not liking my program because i was naturalizing God. Uh, there was one guy who uh, complained about this and he was trying to find a hole in my argument with the lithium. And he said, well, the reason that it was uh, the other rats were not, um, not what the lithium was not affecting the other rats as much is because lithium was the lithium seven is heavier and therefore it distributed in the bloodstream more slowly. And it caused this, you know, it wasn't able to cause the effect as efficiently in the, the rats. Right. Yeah. Kind of because he's, producing these the same thing you might expect like a kind of something that a materialist might want to try to point out to shoot the argument down but he's doing it from this completely different dualist direction because he doesn't like <laughs> anyway um the xenon experiment though shut this down completely because it's it's very really, number one xenon is a much heavier element, it's like i think 54 or something like that and um so any difference in isotope, it's not going to be that much. Like the, the lightest L, uh, isotope in the experiment was uh, xenon-129. The heaviest was xenon-134, right? So ma maximum difference of like five neutrons among 134 baryons in the the atom, right? And then the the, the, the two um, smallest ones, there was the, the, the shortest difference between them is 131 and 132. So that's literally just a single neutron difference. It's, it's, hard, it's not going to distribute in the bloodstream anymore slowly. But what was interesting, though, was that the xenon 129 and 131 have spin, quantum spins of one half and three quarters, um, respectively, or maybe three halves, respectively, okay? 
whereas xenon 132 and 134 have spins of zero. Z the, the xenon 132 and 134 obviously heavier than 129 and 131, but it turns out that the xenon with the um, the, the heavier isotopes without the spin produce a greater effect with anesthesia. So it's the reverse. It's it's the, the heavier elements produce the stronger effect rather than the lighter elements as with the lithium. But the difference was, was the quantum spin. So it directly refutes what he was, what, what the guy was saying was, you know, it's because it's going through the bloodstream more slowly because it's, these guys are the heavier ones and they're having the more effect. And um, it was the heavier xenon isotopes produce the stronger anesthetic effect and the lighter ones uh, had a substantially lower anesthetic effect. And it was the exact same chemical property. And the other thing about this was, is when you think about what is xenon? Xenon is a noble gas. See, that's a red flag right there because noble gases don't have chemical properties. They have, you know, full eight valence electrons. They're not going to, they're not going to change anything. You see what I'm saying? Um, well, yeah. So I, chemically that makes sense. Um, is, is there anything else you wanted to add about that before we... Oh, um, I wanted to get into a little bit of how I, this kind of hopes to uh, replicate the emergentism. Like, I mean, from, you know, looking at this from a philosophy of mind point of view, I can't literally, I mean, Chalmers is right when he says strong emergence is magic. And Sammy Harris says the same thing. Like it's, you have. What do you these, mean by strong emergence? Strong emergence of consciousness. So strong versus weak. Weak emergence is where you have. Uh, example of weak emergence would be an ant colony, right? You have a bunch of ants and they get uh, little pieces of silt and clay and they get together and they create an ant hill, right? Where you can obviously see though, well, if you move this silt molecule here, you can you can compute, you know, the motion of the ant, etc. You can put together an ant hill. You can see how the ant colony literally emerges from its constituent parts, or maybe a house emerges from the bricks and the mortar and the uh, insulation and the, the the wood and all that, right? You can see, you can logically compute how you can derive the house from the components or the ant hill from the well, sand. Well, that just seems right. to be saying that weak emergence is emergence that we understand, and strong right. emergence would be the emergence that we don't understand. We, that doesn't seem to be a very helpful distinction. We don't understand it. The reason we don't understand it is because the term. So, in the case of the house and the building parts, the construction elements. Those they're using the same third person terms. You can reduce the house back down. You can see, well, you have the, the house is described completely in third person terms and you're reducing it back down to third person terms. And I, I call this thing explanatory continuity where you start with, a, you know, any any um, explanation, any logical explanation is going to have a conclusion, which is some some set of terms like in an abstract fashion, say P, Q and R. Well, P, Q and R, if they show up in the inclusion, they have to show up in the premises as well. Right. Because you can't, you know, that's how it, deductive logic works. Yeah, exactly. And so any explanation has to follow deductive logic. Well, the problem with strong emergence is you start with terms P, Q and R, which is all third person. And then somehow you at the end of the explanation, you get terms A, B and C, which is, you know, qualia and emotion and subjective states of experience and a Cartesian ego. And it's like, well, these these concepts are not related to I mean, this is not to say that strong emergence is not true, but they're not conceptually related to things like synapses and electrochemicals and so on. Okay. Yeah. So go ahead. They're, they're related in a post hoc way. So it's not that we, it's not that there is some explanation out there that we have not yet discovered that we will discover, and then it will be weak emergence. The problem is that the terms are mismatched. The, what you're trying to explain is different than what you're trying to explain with. Well, this is, this was sort of um, Hume's point about morality as well. If you have, I mean, I, I, others have argued that this applies in any domain. It's not specific to morality. Right. That if you if you make an argument, the the terms of the conclusion must be uh, included in at least one of the premises, because otherwise it's it's not going to follow, as you've just said. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. And and insofar as people, insofar as anyone wanted to have an explanation of qualia or first person experience, that um, the 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 terms that they're trying to explain, the concepts they're trying to explain, must also appear in the premises or the uh, the, the postulates that they're using as part of the theory. I agree with that. Right. That's just the structure of an explanation, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, right. what I'm continue. saying is that's why I believe. And so, no, this is kind of ironic because I, I, a lot of theists will say they, they, you know, no, no, and they get ridiculed for this, like the notion of God being magic, right? He's the the sky fairy or whatnot, and and 
he operates outside of physical laws and you can't understand him fully, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And there's like a, and people then ridicule this as magic because it's a magic being a, uh, just a kind of replacement term for a lack of explanation or an in principle impossibility of explanation. Right. So the issue here is I actually don't like magic and I don't like it in my explanations. And I think that, you know, this is maybe it's just a bias. I don't think that magic exists in nature and uh, meaning gap in explanation. And so the problem here is that with you, you with strong emergence, you have this problem with, I mean, if that is to be taken literally, you're going to have a gap in explanation. You're going to have, no something with no first person states and then suddenly it emerges and then a miracle happens and then suddenly you have quality and subjective experience and so on and so because of that on like a purely a priori ground i mean maybe this is a, a faith in the psr that there is a, everything has an explanation i think there has to be mentality some kind of first person mentality baked in at the microphysical level and i think well in this case i think quantum cognition is pointing that by saying you know when you said strawberry and vanilla for example those are those i think in my view those are actually individual states in a wave function somewhere sorry you you just said something before that i want to clarify you said that something must be baked in at the microphysical level what what was what did you say mentality so you mentality have to, okay you yeah. have to have first person states somehow baked in and in this case the quantum cognition i think that's the case because you know if you're looking at just the schrodinger equation you know science for the most part, with the we get the single exception of the observer effect, which is like the only thing in all of science that um, kind of bridges Levine's explanatory gap. With the exception of that, everything else in science is sort of categorically like a third person description. So you say, well, you know, you see like a wave function of um, a bunch of subatomic particles, right? And you're like, well, that's just the wave function of an electron. It's, it's there's nothing mental about it, but well, of course there's nothing mental about it because that's your third person description. You're not going to see. You know, for, for the same reason we don't know if Google's Lambda is conscious or not, you know, we can't get into the quantum state itself unless we are the quantum state. And we, so the reason we're not seeing its first person mentality is because we're only describing the third person aspect of it. Yeah. And so what I okay. think, though, is that when, when, when you just said strawberry and vanilla there, I think those actually are two individual quantum states correlated to something in your brain. Like, oh, it's actually uh, a wave function there. And in that wave function, there is a mental state or mental um, conception of strawberry and a mental conception of vanilla. Interesting. So, so let's, um, l let me try to uh, summarize what you've argued. There seem to be sort of two, well, maybe three uh, main routes here. So one was that uh, was from quantum cognition, which was, is a set of models, which uses the formalisms of some of the formalisms of quantum mechanics, such as Schrodinger's equation, superposition, Hilbert space, and so forth to describe certain cognitive processes. So you argue that, um, the success of these applications gives us some reason to think that um, the mind is is a, a quantum system. You then presented some experimental evidence that you argue um, uh, is in favor of that hypothesis. So the lithium experiments in mice and then the, the xenon experiments uh, that you just did a video on. Um, then the third line that you just mentioned just immediately before this um, is more of a, I guess, a philosophical um, reasoning based on the qualities of explanation so that in order to account for first person uh, qualia like experiences um, we can never do that just by um, referring to or talking about um, third person states of affairs but we need to postulate um, qualia or mentality I think as you said at, um, as fundamental components of reality in some way in order to be able to account for them yeah is that accurate yeah it's okay. actually kind of funny because that, that that I call that the I had this argument called the foundationalist argument, and that's the the core cause of the foundationalist argument. But it stemmed from another argument, which is I was, I was trying to see why the other argument worked. I mean, I knew that it worked. It was is pretty very simple. But I was like, there's something there's, there's a deeper argument hidden in this argument. I, I want to tease it out and see what it is. And eventually, I came to this whole. It has to do with epistemology and the fundamental nature of explanation and so on. But the other kind of argument in between we called this the introspective argument. You might have seen this one, the introspective argument, IPs. Uh, my possibly, argument, yeah, I don't recall. It's very simple. Basically, what it does is it argues that the mind is immaterial using one of the, you know, standard philosophic arguments and philosophy of mind for the immaterial of the mind, which is, you know, very basic. Cartesian skepticism is one example of it. You can imagine the mind in isolation from everything else in the world, everything material. You can't imagine material, you know, in a dream world, for example, even though you can imagine the mind. So therefore, being in a dream world, so therefore, mind is not material. 
And then the second one was, it's kind of irritated people because it's, you know, classically people who are of the, the theist category were arguing for substance dualism. And one of the favorite arguments, including my own against this was um, the interaction problem, right? You know, how do you have immaterial substance causing material interactions with the body, right? And so the argument then was, well, you can't. And so you have to get rid of other substances. You can only have one substance because you're going to have this interaction problem. And and then so therefore, mind is a fundamental substance and you can't have more than one substance. So therefore, everything's mind. And then we kind of further, pro I further probed into why that explanation works. And I realized the interaction problem and the hard problem are actually the same problem from two different sides. This is an explanatory gap that that whole issue of you need to derive the conclusions from the premises and you can't applies to both the hard problem and the interaction problem from two different it's the same problem upside down one is you start with matter you got to get subjective mentality out of it the other one is you start with subjective mentality and you somehow have to use get that to somehow cause a material cause in some effect and you can't you know it's you can't follow from a immaterial mind to somehow producing some kind of physical effect unless there's some kind of by definition, physical property the mind has. So that, that's when I realized this deeper uh, thing called the foundationalist argument. So, Right. That's interesting. So um, if we discuss, um, yeah, so so coming back to what I said before, those, those three lines, I think I would like to say a few things about, about each of those. Uh, I think, well, let's start with quantum cognition since that was what we, uh, what you started talking about. Um, I, I mean, as I think you know, because you, you saw at least one of my videos on this, I, I'm not very, um, I'm not very impressed by arguments which draw on uh, mathematical, which draw on the fact that there are similar mathematical tools used in two different areas that argue, therefore, there must be some sort of fundamental link between those areas. Um, so, so let's take quantum cognition uh, as as the example, obviously, and unpack that a little bit. Um, in terms of cognition, there is no real standard approach. Quantum cognition is one set of approaches which use some of the formalisms of quantum mechanics. There are many other approaches. There's Bayesian approaches to cognition. There's information theoretic approaches. There's like reinforcement learning approaches, um, like machine learning. Uh, there's the classical like Chomsky um, uh, transformative grammar types of approaches, generative grammar. And, and they're used for somewhat different things, right? But um, I, I would say that these are just all different models that we can use to describe certain aspects of cognition, certain types of uh, phenomena uh, to yield predictive power in experiments. And quantum cognition seems to have some value there. I'm not an expert there, so I can't say exactly how useful it is, although it, it is a minority in the field, I would say. Um, but the, um, the, the fact that certain formalisms are useful, I, I don't know that that tells us anything other than the formalism is useful. So if, if we talk specifically about um, the quantum formalism, it is an extremely flexible formalism. Like Hilbert space is a very general idea. Um, I mean, that's sort of borrowed from mathematics to understand. Right. Well, it, it Hilbert space configurations actually, of possibilities. The mathematical right? definition of Hilbert space expands to a whole lot more than just the Schrodinger equation. It's, it's... Exactly. But, and so, I mean, but when, the, when they're when they're using it in that context, though, I mean, like, so you use Hilbert space in a math context, you're going to say, well, it's the set of all functions that are, you know, have a, a finite integral. Of, you know, you, you can you can square them and then take the integral and you yeah, get some right. finite element out. But as with with physics, so that describes though, a very general class of functions. It's a very general class of function, but with physics, though, and this is probably not the best way to be using this kind of language. But they do it anyway, because when you're dealing with physics, when you're talking about Hilbert space in physics, there is only, I mean, to my knowledge anyway, unless it's maybe some weird, you know, classical, I mean, I'm sure there's other applications of it, but generally speaking, they're going to use it in just the quantum sense. And it probably because of a kind of a sloppy use of language, you do it because, you know, in physics, they're saying Hilbert space, well, 99% of the equations they're going to be dealing with in physics are going to be some application of the Schrodinger equation. Like it, it's, it's, and the Schrodinger equation spits out wave functions and most of what unless you're like in you know astrophysics or something you're dealing with general relativity instead most of the equations you're going to be doing with in your day-to-day -day physics is going to be computing wave functions and you know dealing with systems with wave functions so yes but the, so yeah and i know again. that's a sloppy use of the language and all that but i mean it, they're, they're using it in a slightly different sense when they when they use it there in Hilbert space in a slightly different sense than you would in mathematics, where it's this more general class of the set of all functions with these properties. 
yeah, that's that's fine. But the Hilbert space is still specific to the system being studied, right? Um, likewise, right. the likewise is the uh, the the quantum state. So. Uh, the the wave function is just an abstract representation of the quantum state of whatever system you're looking at. So you can analogize that to representing a, the cognitive state of some system that you're you're describing. Likewise, Schrodinger's equation. I don't know precisely what role that plays in, in these theories, but there's nothing sort of magical about Schrodinger's equation. I'm not saying you said that, right? But sometimes people get this idea in their mind that it's sort of something I don't know somehow more than it is. It's really just a partial differential equation, which is based on the heat equation. So the the, the fact that a system may be described by the Schrodinger equation it doesn't in any way to me say that it's underlying quantum in nature it just means that there are certain regularities that can be described right. by that partial differential equation it's just that what i'm saying is that that's that's not just a you know partial differential equation or a equation that can be described by hilbert space functions it's a very specific one with specific like, there are, there are no other ones that have superposition built in like that is a spec that's specifically built in there to deal with the notion of probability like you're dealing with probability waves rather than some other kind of wave so it's 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 more specific than just, I mean, yes, it could be a coincidence, but it, it's it's a lot more specific and it, it's so specific as to raise a question of, you know, I gave the example of Kaluza Klein theory before, you know, when you end up with a, a coincidence like that, it's maybe it's just a coincidence, but it's a coincidence that's marked enough to make you kind of raise your eyebrow and go, I wonder what else is hiding down here kind of thing. You know, is this more than an, a an accident? You, you phrase it as a coincidence, but I don't think that that's accurate. It's not as if that these theories or sorry, these formalisms were re rediscovered by quantum scientists. Uh, sorry, by cognitive scientists, I mean to say. Um, rather, they were deliberately borrowed from quantum mechanics precisely because... Um, they did that. Yeah, but precisely because they saw that there were uh, some loose analogies, particularly between superposition. So you talked about the idea that we sort of have two ideas in mind and and one uh, we sort of somehow collapse to one. That that idea, as I understand it, was seen as analogous to, to uh, in quantum mechanics, analogous to the way that we sometimes make decisions or gestalt perception, I think. But why would like, it have Is it the be... duck or is it the rabbit kind of thing? Right, again? but why would it have so They to borrowed be... the formalism to try to develop a theory for that. It's, it's, there's no coincidence here. It was deliberately... Right, well, what I'm trying to say is, is you can have... Um... You can have more than one type of thing that has superposition. I mean, you don't have to have a wave equation with, you know, I mean, yes, you can have the cat's dead and alive, but the the probability distribution of that cat being dead and alive is, for some reason, described by a wave equation rather than, you know, you could describe by any number of other types of... Yeah, but the as I said, the Schrodinger equation is effectively a form of the heat equation with, like, potential energy added in. And the heat equation is used in all... Uh, partial differential equations used in all sorts of applications, um, including particle diffusion and also the Black-Scholes equation in for option price dance uh, uses a form of the heat equation as well. I don't know right. precisely exactly what... The but there are equation equations is used for in superposition, though. You see what I'm saying? It, well, it, 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 hang on. So we, we need to, in assessing this, we need to be careful and look at sort of one thing at a time, right? So there's the Schrodinger equation, which is a partial differential equation, which is used to describe the like, um, uh, essentially like diffusion in certain systems. Um, the fact that it can describe certain aspects of cognition, I don't know why that would be surprising. In terms of superposition, so that's a wave phenomenon. Uh, that's a, a very general phenomenon, and it doesn't fall out of the Schrodinger equation. It falls out particularly in quantum mechanics. Superposition comes out ultimately from the fact that um, that the operators don't commute right so you you don't um so well I, that's going to be too hard to explain here but basically if you def if you apply operations like um a and then b or b and then a it it, it makes a difference like um whereas right. so, no, 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 that's the whole just... thing like it's the heisenberg uncertainty principle you have the uh, the uh, operators for position and the operations for velocity don't commute with each other like in any yes. any other class of like energy and time for example zero one is any any two sets of variables that do not compute um well yeah and, and in the, that gives rise right, right. to interaction terms between different quantum systems right so so the idea of commutivity is if i have five plus seven that's the same as seven plus five right that's because addition is commutative in regular algebra but that's not true in quantum systems it, it, to use an analogy right just just for our audience to understand that point so so that can give rise to interaction between different quantum systems where normally we would think well they're two separate things right and like billiard balls they might bounce off each other but they don't kind of merge into each other well that's not how it works in quantum mechanics anyway the point is that that sort of those sort of interaction superposition and um interference principles come out of the non-commutative algebra they don't come out of schrodinger's equation so there's there's different pieces of the quantum formalism, like the Hilbert space, the non-commutivity, the Schrodinger's equation, probably others I'm forgetting, um, that give rise to different phenomena. And they're all borrowed specifically to account for particular um, 
like cognitive phenomena that are of interest, right? And okay, that's going to depend on the specific the application. Thing, though, there's, nothing, the, there's nothing that surprises me there about that because they're using these tools precisely to account for certain phenomena. Why should the cognitive... Um, here's the thing, though, the underlying problem with this is why should the... If, if the brain is a, you know, or if your cognitive processes are determined by classical operations, right? Yeah. Why should they be behaving a superposition formalism in the first place? Like, well, why should we well, have... I don't think they do in general. In certain applications of it, that's why... In, a lot of times, we, I mean, we, we have fuzzy logic happening a lot. Like, whenever you make a choice, there's fuzzy logic going on, you know, and it's... Well, no, I, I, I don't Not always, that. but even to it, some extent... Fuzzy you know, logic is a particular formalism that we can use to uh, describe well, logical deductions, really. As I said, quantum cognition is only one of many different approaches to understanding cognition. And you could just as equally say, well, it's it's all reinforcement learning, or it's all like a generative grammar, um, or it's all Bayes, Bayes theorem, right? I guess the question uh, they're is- different is, formalisms that describe different experimental results or different Why uh, different should the findings. brain, and I'm not a neuroscientist, so maybe, maybe this is just my ignorance of that particular field, but why should the brain not behave more like a kind of a digital computer, as it were? Like, in some ways of, it does, but in other ways it doesn't. It, does, like, it depends but... what you're talking about. But also, th these results are in quantum cognition, not at the level of the brain. So these these theories, uh, at least to, to the extent that I've seen them, and I, again, I don't claim to be an expert in quantum cognition, but they're they're describing um, a behavioral or psychological um, results, like like gestalt perception or like um, d decision making. They're not describing it at the level of the neuroscience. So I think it's a bit misleading to then jump down to that level and talk about the brain as a quantum system, because uh, that's not what these theories are describing. They're talking about the level of psychology. And to me, it's not really that surprising that certain uh, facets of psychology might be describable using principles of like superposition or, or wave mechanics or these other things, right. precisely because A, they're quite general, and B, there are many facets of cognition. So some of them might be describable using these things. And C, they were these tools were selected deliberately to describe these certain phenomena. It's not as if there right, was no, a, a coincidence. Is, why do those phenomena exist in the first place? It is kind of a curious thing that you you should have this waffling behavior when you make choices. Like, what? Why do we have this notion? Like, I mean, whether or not there is free will, for example. I mean, people have like this intuition that there is. And even if, you know, it's not proper free will, the point is that th this this notion of this ambivalence is so strong that we on a day to day basis, we have this assumption that, you know, I could have done that. I did this or I don't know which one I'll choose type of thing. Like this is like a day to day thing that it happens all the time. And it's it's kind of a mystery why a purely classical system should behave like that. Why well, is it? <laughs> I don't quite understand how free will really or the sense of free will fits into this because there's no, well, at least standardly in quantum mechanics, there are interpretations, of course. Standardly, there's no free will in quantum mechanics, right? Oh, there's no, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that. that occurs and that's I'm not, not saying theorized, that, right? but I'm saying, I'm saying well, so the, how is it better accounted for under a quantum cognition than it is under I'm not, I'm not even saying that there is free will here. I'm saying like there's this intuition of it. That it I'm saying right. like this, this or rather, maybe I shouldn't even say it like that. There is this intuition of ambivalence I mean, this this notion of ambivalence in choice, it shows up so often that it has it gives people this you know it, it's such a strong thing that whether or not you know free will is a thing or whether or not free will is shows up in quantum mechanics, etc. It gives rise to this kind of common day intuition of I could have done otherwise or I don't know what I'll choose, etc. Like this this ambivalence in thinking is a I'm not, not, not forget the free will aspect for a second. Is yeah. the the ambivalence in choice is such a um, a common facet of our day to day experience with cognition that it, it's kind of a mystery as to why a purely classical system, you know, it's like billiard balls. They don't billiard balls don't choose which they roll. They 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 you know you give the momentum, and if the the pool table has some rut in it or something, it's going to go off in this way or that way. But it's it's very so much purely, very simple, purely deterministic systems can exhibit behavior which appears to be um, highly, highly planned or highly sort of erratic, in, but in a systematic way. So I'm talking about uh, chaos theory or chaotic systems. Right. Chaotic systems like a, a double pendulum looks like there's some. Uh, I don't know, uh, magic spell master who's deciding what intricate patterns of swinging it goes into, but it's entirely a deterministic system. It's just that we we can't really predict it. We can't see the patterns or fully understand them. So I think that that's using, analogous uh, to so our decisions, using, right? You're using so the complicated. Schrodinger equation then as kind of an ape then to say it's not really, but it could be, you're just modeling chaos theory really. And so it's it's well, there's I, a good way to ape the, um, the superposition so, essentially. Well, let, let me clarify. So Quantum randomness and, and chaos theory are not really connected in any direct way. 
point not. I was saying, yeah, that's not the point I was making. The point I was making was you asked, why is it that we have this sense of um, ambivalence or, or not being able to make up our minds or, or being in two minds about decisions? And my point is that that could arise entirely out of our inability to sort of simply or straightforwardly predict what, like, what we will choose or what in the moment we will, what the decision we will make in the moment, because our mind is such a complicated system. We can see that sort of behavior arising out of even very simple deterministic systems, and so so much more how that could happen in a very complicated system like the brain. Right. Um, and so right. we may not be able to know what we would choose in the moment. And we might like, well, on the one hand, this and on the one hand, that I don't think that there's anything particularly um, surprising about the fact that we may have this sense that we're not quite sure what will happen or we're in two minds and, until it actually comes to decision time. And, and then then we make the decision. I don't think that we need to invoke anything quantum to understand that. OK, so you're saying it could just be chaos theory and then the, that the therefore quantum cognition is. Well, I mean, yeah, chaos theory, theory is a way to simply... think about it. I don't need to invoke that specifically, but that's just a way of understanding how very sort of unpredictable behavior can it's emerge from very simple effect. deterministic systems. Butterfly effect, basically. Well, yeah, that's that's a way to think about it. Yeah. OK, that, so... that's that's fair enough. I mean, I, I suppose you could. That's fair enough. I mean, it. there is also the, the, the qubit unpacking thing, but I mean. That could, I suppose, also be somehow explained away by the. Um, well, surely that's only relevant if we think well. that the, the the mind is behaving as like a quantum computer. But I don't think. I know, I know but, but even if it, it, it even even if it's not behaving as a quantum computer, even the, the chaos theory thing, I mean, it does have that. The very fact that there is ambivalence there means you have to treat them as separate states. But I suppose if you're dealing with the the, the butterfly effect thing, I and mean, the, the brain is not exactly a classical computer. It's it's you know. That's also well, no, no, it's not. There, so it's not. Yeah, it's not either of those types of computers. But we can use classical computer as an analogy. I mean, that's another example of a like a formalism that we can use that I think has been taken too far. That the brain is like a classical computer. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm ways, taking but... one one model, which is kind of an oversimplification, and using it to say, well, therefore, other thing, which I don't think is an over, but it may maybe if your argument's right, maybe it is. Well, I mean, that's, that's how I think about it. Um, but I, I want to move on now and just briefly comment on the Xenon experiments, because I did actually watch the video that you put up because I was having a look on your channel. By the way, I'll include a link to your channel in the video description. Thanks. Someone in the comments noted in the chat here noted that I hadn't done that. So I, I will do that after after we finish talking. But um, yeah, so I, I was having a look on your, your channel and I did watch that video. Um, so I, I, I had a look at the paper that you're referring to because, um, yeah, I, as you mentioned, um, IP... Uh, well, I think you as well, but also IP cited the earlier lithium experiments, uh, making a similar point. Um, but the xenon experiments are different because weight different or mass differences can't seem to be, um, it don't seem to be relevant there, as you said, because the isotopes are very similar mass. But I mean, just having a look at this paper, I mean, it's an interesting paper, right? I, I feel like that the, the title, uh, which was actually, let me just pull that up, because I think the title was really uh, pushing a bit. It says, Implications for the Mechanisms of Anesthesia and Consciousness. Um, I, I thought that that was a bit strong because what they're really showing is that there is a difference in the effect of xenon on um, uh, the effectiveness of anesthesia. It, actually, I forget what the organism was that they used here, but it, it doesn't really matter for my point. Uh, the point is that they say at the very like start of their paper in the abstract, xenon is known to be an an, an NMDA receptor antagonist. An NMDA is a um, uh, is a an ion channel in neurons, so it's it's involved in mediating synaptic uh, synaptic processing of information. Now, whenever you have um, these sort of antagonists, basically molecules that block the activity of uh, of an enzyme, in this case, it's an ion channel. Um, almost always, that's in, that involves quantum processes, uh, and that's what they they mention here. They say the in, interaction of xenon with the receptor is determined by quantum level van der Waals London forces between the electron shells of xenon and the electron shells of the nonpolar regions of the NMDA receptor. Now, if people don't follow all of that, it doesn't matter. The, the point is that most enzymes and most um, active well, active sites in the enzymes um, require quantum level analysis to fully understand because it's not just basically like bits of the molecule hitting each other, which you can understand classically. It's this, it's the specific interaction of electron shells and oxidation states and things like that. Um, th this is, I mean, this is nothing new, right? Th anyone who's studied like hemoglobin will, will know that the oxidation states of the heme, uh, the heme group, the, the ion in the heme group are relevant for understanding how it grabs and then lets go of oxygen in, in different states. So really, it seems to me that all that's happening here is that xenon has this um, quantum spin interaction, which is relevant to its interaction with the NMDA receptor. And the quantum spin does depend, uh, as you noted before, on the number of neutrons in the nucleus, not just on the uh, on the electron shell. So 
what you're saying is correct. This is not purely a chemical property. This 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 because chemical properties are just about the electron shells, the valence electrons. Um, but quantum properties are known to be uh, and interactions are known to be important in in these sorts of biochemical interactions. And so I I just don't really see this as any evidence for some sort of quantum quantum brain or, or quantum mind. This, this is just I mean this but is just biochemistry. Consciousness is mediated by the. I mean, well, I guess the issue there is, is I mean, if you're dealing with anesthesia, the consciousness literally is in the chemistry in a sense, right? I mean, it's it's well, chemistry, but understood to include certain uh, certain quantum processes that are technically not chemical, right? But it, like as I mentioned, right, uh, the, the interactions of enzymes and active states. So technically, that's not chemistry, although you will study it in chemistry courses, right? But yes, so technically, if it's if it's a phenomenon that involves nuclear spin, it's not chemical. And so, if someone says that the brain is just like uh, a, a bunch of chemical interactions. Technically, they're wrong because some of the processes that are important are not chemical. Um, but I, I don't know that that's I, I don't think that anything sort of very important follows from that in terms of our, our discussion, because it simply means that in some cases, like nuclear spin or, or other quantum uh, properties are relevant for certain types of interactions. I mean, this has been known for a very long time. There's nothing, as right. I mentioned, right. hemoglobin is an example. Is, is if that if, if one of those particular non non chemical, you know, quantum um interactions in chemistry it happens to be what shuts consciousness down would it then follow that whatever the consciousness is it's not a it, it's not part of the chemical properties per se it's part of the quantum properties well i don't really see how because we know that consciousness is well so i mean the standard view would be that consciousness however it occurs is mediated through uh firing of action potentials by neurons and the firing of action potentials by neurons is dependent on these on ion channels, which which mediate the flow of ions that's necessary for um, the action potentials to be transmitted across uh, across synapses, and this is and blocking those action potentials. Yeah, so so the so xenon is a is an NMDA receptor antagonist, which means it blocks the NMDA receptor, or at least inhibits its 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 function. I don't know exactly how, uh, which means that it blocks the transmission of action potentials, at least to a certain degree, and that's going to disrupt consciousness. So, I mean, this is just a very reductionist principle Maybe about this how. Is, I, I'm thinking. I think. I think part of the problem here is that. I'm starting from a very, we're kind of thinking about consciousness, but we're dealing with the same facts. We're thinking of it in a kind of a different fashion. Whereas for, when I think of conscious, I think of a, a thing of sorts, right? So when I think of, I see the, you know, the, the action potentials there, and I see this ion channel, I'm trying to see quote unquote, the consciousness in the ion channel, so to speak. And so that I want to imagine, say, I, I mean, you know, Beck and Eccles had this example of they, they see a wave function uh, going across the, um, the action potential. Uh, they were kind of, kind of thing along my my lines, and so it's well. Well, seeing consciousness in a single receptor is rather strange, partly because there are a very large number of them in the brain, and you wouldn't want to say that like each of them is consciousness. Or, I mean, I guess well, it has entangled as part of. Sorry, yeah, has consciousness. I suppose you could say they're all entangled as part of the brain's quantum well, system. But I, I, that I don't know why we need to suppose that. Other point is that well, I think look, and this is of course this is where it gets into that kind of weird thing where I was saying you know. We want to solve conscious. We need to take account of both the hard and easy problems at the same time, the, the epistemic problem, as well as the, you know, the, the empirical data. And this is why I would think that, you know, conscious would be located at each one of those points is that consciousness has, you know, as I point out from an epistemic constraint, and remember, I know this is not, you know, purely empirically motivated. This is, um, this is the, the a priori epistemic issue that we have to deal with. Is that um, conscious? Whatever consciousness is, it has to be something fundamental. And so, okay, well, that, that's there. the third. That's the third point that you mentioned. So maybe we'll, we'll move on to that then. So, so your, your sort of consideration as to why consciousness has to be fundamental is that we can't sort of form an explanatory theory that gets us from like third person uh, objective facts to uh, to an explanation of qualia. Right. Oh, um, uh, before we get there, though, I wanted to quick make two points that were related to this of why I think. It would be good. I mean, this is again a priori motivation, but reasons to think that there would be entanglement going on inside the brain, right? And that is number one, if you think about binding, and this is also an a priori consideration, you know, say we see the, the live button up in the top there, there's a little red square, there's red color qualia in it, and you see, you know, these little numbers inside, and there's, you know, they have geometric shape and the white color. You cannot dissociate those particular color quality of states from you can't associate the redness from the shape for example and you can't associate that from the rest of the screen and so on and mm -hmm. so the point being made is that 
those are individual pieces of information, yet they are not, you can't dissociate them from each other. And so it, it looks, I mean, that the only thing that describes that in a abstract sense is entanglement. And so now I know that is an a priori consideration, but if you want to say, take the a priori and then say, where do we see something having the same kind of structure in nature, you'd see entanglement. And then that would lead to, well, therefore the consciousness is located all over the brain in this entanglement structure. And then the other thing, and this, I think might, this kind of touches on the empirical side. And this is something that says, this is where I, you know, I meet halfway on this. And I say, you have the, um, you know, this empirical notion of the mind being emergent because you have all these, these neurons are all firing together. They all, well, of course it's a function because it's, you know, the neurons are firing and when neurons aren't firing, there's no consciousness. So therefore, obviously consciousness is a function and obviously it has to be emergent because it's, you know, it only happens when you have all these neurons operating in unison. Well, the neat thing with entanglement is that that behaves the same way. I mean, it's kind of cool with, you know, wave functions is you, and I, I've been playing around with this idea actually for a while. I, I, I have a suspicion as to why we're not finding the quantum activity in the brain. And it has something to do with the fact of, um, this, well, I'll go there in just a second. But um, the point uh, here, though, is that entanglement can make a very good mimic of emergentism because you have all these seeming parts. They're not all seeming part. They're, there's a single state, but that single state is located all over the place. It's located in each one of those individual cells and each one of those ion channels independently. That it's all one single state stretched across the whole. And so, yes, it's going to look emergent and yes, it's going to look functionalist precisely because it is this one state that is seemingly to us from, you know, know, after you collapse the wave function, you see these individual particles that are all seemingly acting independently. And therefore, you see them as, you know, this big emergent conglomerate producing consciousness, where in reality, it's this one single state underlying the whole thing. And so it would match the data that would lead to that would suggest emergence as well as functionalism, just that it would also at the same time match the other a priori consideration of consciousness has to be fundamental. So, so I don't. So, so to say that things are entangled is really just to say that they are correlated uh, in a in a certain way. But they're um, correlated uh, specifically in a way that you cannot reduce them. You can't. You can't say. This can be broken apart. You can't imagine this thing being kind of broken. You, you can't break redness well, down. Or you can't break the redness apart from the squareness. Um, well, hang on. So, so in in physics, right, entanglement is, is referring to a certain type of correlation, and and you can break apart an entangled system. It, it's no longer entangled after you do that, right? But like, right, no longer entangled, entangled and you don't have it yeah. anymore. So, an entangled system is in is uh, describable as a single quantum system, right? Um, and so the subsystems are, yeah, anyway. So analogi- analogizing that to, to consciousness, when we have conscious perceptions, there are different aspects or properties of that experience, which we can't experience sort of separately from the others. Um, I don't know if that's actually true because at least people report weird things when uh, when under the influence of psychoactive substances, but let's put that aside for the moment. I don't really have experience there myself, but under normal I, circumstances, I, I don't least, either, but I do know we can't separate those. Do. We'll talk about that later after. Well, we don't need to go into that now. I just wanted yeah. to put, sort of footnote that. But um, so I, I, I don't know how that, like, it, that doesn't seem to me to really replicate the notion of entanglement in physics. For a start, as I said, in physics, you you can disentangle them uh, just by like interacting yeah. them, and that's that seems to be different. But the other well, thing you is can that, do that with this as well. I mean, it's called you know either brain death or maybe you know someone. Gets well, we don't experience anything after brain death. No, we don't. That's the whole not... point. The entanglement breaks down. That's the point. You no longer have. I mean, the, the the experience in this case would be, let's say, I become brain dead right now, right? And so my current experience is the, the little live button up in the corner with the red in it. And then there's the white wall in the background and my desktop around that and the room around that, et cetera. Say I become brain dead. Well, that I no longer have that experience. Well, of course I don't because all those things suddenly become disentangled because my consciousness is that entanglement pattern. Yeah. Well, let me offer an alternative theory. So the reason that we experience certain, um, properties as sort of bundled together like color and shape for example is because of the way that our visual system is structured such that it um represents different aspects of objects as a uh, a unified whole actually there is there is a question here about how that is done uh, precisely which uh, i don't know 
you might want to appeal to, which is the uh, the binding problem in, in neuroscience, mm -hmm. essentially how different properties of the stimuli are sort of combined together. Um, I think that this is more of a pseudo problem than anything, but you just I mean, gave me a realization. Or this is actually cool because I'm going to use this as an argument in the future. This is a realization I just had now. Um, that that problem you mentioned, I realized the, binding the problem. The only thing that could solve the binding problem. Now, of course, how you do this is a whole other matter. I mean, we require a lot of technical because there's you know entanglement is its own thing. You can't just take the concept, but I mean, you'd have to actually you know when are you doing interdisciplinary research you have to make sure the concepts on both sides match, but I realize entanglement is the only thing in all of physics that could match the binding problem perfectly. Because if you're dealing with a classical system, well, let's, let's freeze a classical system for a moment. Let's have, you know, you have, it, it's not a single gestalt. It's a set of, a binding is a single gestalt. You cannot break them apart, right? They're, they are irreducible. Whereas with a classical system, you could, you could just freeze the system and say, no, these are not all one single. I mean, yes, they're all, you know, the, the, the watch, for example, you know, 19th century watch, it looks like a single system. And in a certain sense, it is a single system. But if you were to freeze it in time and just look at all the parts, no, there's this moving gear, there's this moving gear, they interact, but they're all individual parts individually moving together as a whole. And this is, it's so tightly held together that it re resembles a gestalt to a certain level of approximation, but it's not. It's just a bunch of, you look at a really fine level, it's a bunch of individual parts that are dissociated from each other, even though they, they make a pretty good approximation of a gestalt at a larger scale. Whereas in this case, with with binding, you can't do that. It, it, they are literally irreducible. They're, you, know, in, um, you cannot dissociate them from each other. Well, in the same percept, yeah. So we we don't experience, a, yeah. We don't ex we don't experience a percept as separately comprised of its different components. We perceive them as bound uh, or combined together. I would postulate that that is simply just a product of the way that our visual system processes information and sort of delivers it to our conscious awareness. If if I can use that term, I, I don't know why why quantum would some sort of quantum entanglement would, would be the only way of, of doing that. I mean, it, it's just to say that they always co-occur in our perception. Right. But that's, that's the, thing, the correlation. There's always, no that, that, that's, that's what I'm saying is they, they wouldn't always call it. They, that co-occurrence thing. Well, why not? Because it wouldn't actually be a perfect, it wouldn't be perfect co-occurrence. It would be like the watch. It, it's, it's, Yes, it's a they they co occur in a I mean you can say there's an approximation right but it's not an approximation it, it, it's perfectly um, correlated or perfectly connected together so it, it's well, I don't it's, know that it is perfect right to know that it's perfect what you'd have to do is look at any sort of borderline or degenerate state so that would include cases of um, hallucinations hallucinogens um, brain damage. And it, it seems to me, I mean, I don't know what those perceptions are like, right? We only have people's reports. But from what I hear, that there are sort of weird cases. One example that I'll put forward is synesthesia. Synesthesia I was about is to say where, it's synesthesia. Yeah. So that's when people have sort of strange um, associate, well, strange by a normal perception, at least, associations of, say, tastes with colors or, or colors with numbers or things like that. Um, now, that's not exactly a, well, it's sort of a dissociation. It's also sort of a strange binding between different uh, properties that normally you, you wouldn't sort of have. Um, now, that's just one that I'm aware of. I'm sure there's been plenty of other work on, on different states. So right. uh, your claim is that the correlation is perfect. I, I'm not sure. Uh, that doesn't seem likely well, even to in me. Synesthesia, I suspect that though, that's not true. When the even brain in synesthesia, goes though, wrong. Actually, synesthesia is interesting because you'd have a case where they would be you know, disentangled and reentangled. I mean, even in that case, like say you see a, um, a loud strawberry or something, right? Or taste a loud strawberry. Well, to us, that's obviously there's, there's something wrong with the way it's being processed. But the point is, is that even the person who does experience a loud strawberry is, um, you know, or a green sound or whatnot, is um, that still is bound. It, it, it's in, yes, it's dissociated, but now it's been rebound in such a way that the, the, the greenness and the loudness are um, inextricably linked to each other. So, yes, there's been dissociation, but the thing is that in the reassociation of it, you now cannot dissociate the greenness from the loudness. They are one unified whole, perfectly so. 
Yeah, well, the synesthesia was just an example of how the correlation seems to to break down. Well, what you've what you've said is that well, it, a new correlation arises. Well, yeah, but that to to, uh, to say that there are to say that our experience is such that we perceive multiple properties as being sort of sort of linked um, is just to, to me seems to be the way that our perception works. Now, are, are there ever weird states where somehow they, they become disassociated? I gave synesthesia as a sort of a rough example, but it's not precisely maybe what you were looking for, but I'm sure that there's a lot of interesting work on this that I'm not aware of because I don't really follow the sort right. of- Right, uh, I, I guess I would have to see- Gestalt this. perception sort of literature. I would but have to see the- ex Your claim example. is that the correlation's perfect and I, I don't know what the evidence is for that. Well, the, the evidence is, I mean, this is this is me going on my own conscious experience. Like, like what I'm saying, like, I mean, literally like, when I'm saying this is like, I, I know my own conscious experience better than anyone in the world. And so because of that, it's like, there's like an a priori thing. And I, I if there is some exception to that rule, I mean, maybe there is, but I'd, I'd have well, to it, see what it is. Well, you wouldn't be able to perceive it, right? You, you could read about it, right? Uh, I could read about it, but I get, I get, I'd have to, I'd have to like, I'd have to have some, some explanation that could overcome that a priori certainty I have that the redness and the Y button is, perfectly bound to see, see that earth. certainty doesn't make any sense to me let me give another example so while we're alive our hearts are pretty much always beating now i mean there are people who've experienced uh you know clinical death for a brief period of time and their heart stops beating or who had a surgery but for a lot of people your heart's going to beat pretty much continually until you die right so you could mm -hmm. say look um in my experience the the correlation between me being alive and my heart beating is like one to one um and therefore well, I'm not exactly sure what you'd infer from that. Um, but I would say the way I would explain that is that that's the function of the way our heart works and the way that it supports the rest of our body. Likewise, the fact that under normal conditions, the way that our brain uh, perceives or interprets information is to sort of bind together different properties. Uh, that's just a property of how our brains work. Now, I, I don't know how you get from that to some sort of principle that that they, they cannot come apart like under any circumstances that that's what i don't really understand like it, the observation is normal biological function how can you infer from that that there's some sort of uh perfect correlation between the two that well, transcends here's a way to any do type it. of biological okay, consideration can you imagine redness existing apart from any geometric shape thing which is instantiated well, it's actually very easy to do that. All I have to do is take my glasses off and kind of squint, and then I can see colors oh. without any shapes. Well, the the problem though then is that you you do you really are seeing shapes. They're blurry shapes. They're still shapes, though. I mean, yes, it's blurry. Well, yes, that's the problem, point. right? <laughs> You're asking me to the the notion of shape is so broad now that like, I I don't know how to. Well, I mean, I mean like, if, let's say, like let's say you have what a, would not you know, count as a shape under this under this definition like say, of shape. Say when you have a uh, you know here's an example. You have like a, a movie, right? And in the movie someone gets knocked out, right? And then they start coming to, and you see the camera, like the person in you know, the first person point of view where they're coming to, and the, the camera's all fuzzy, and you're seeing these fuzzy lights and fuzzy shapes and so on. It's kind of representing the person. And then that kind of happens sometimes, you know, in reality when someone wakes up from something like that. But the point is, is if you're, you know, if you were to freeze the, the movie at that point, it still has a shape. I mean, yes, it has blurry outlines. Yes, the... Um, it, it probably fades into some well, other any form. arrangement of yeah. light is a shape in this in this notion so i, I don't know exactly. how it would even exactly. be possible so for, because what we perceive is based on the on the interpretation of the um uh, of uh, photons of light as they're received across our retina we have a certain visual field which is then processed by our brain i the way that the architecture of that works is such that at least under normal conditions um there's always some sort of um spatial arrangement between those uh between the light on our retina and and the light as we perceive it i mean it could, it could be sort of muddled up a bit but um that's just how the visual system works like i don't understand how we can draw anything uh, from that well that's the thing though is that i mean that that's how the visual system works but then going switching to the the first person perspective of that you have this problem where um, well, that's why colors are localized to particular parts of the visual field there's no real surprise there right i know but what i'm saying is is the fact the fact that 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 conscious experience has that the first person side of that has that in, uh, intrinsic property in it and you know and if, if consciousness you know as i pointed out you cannot um you you have to derive like from like whatever is the inclusion must be derived in the well, but i don't things. understand i don't know i fundamentally don't i fundamentally don't understand your argument so let me let me try to explain it so um sound and vision are separable in our senses like you can have a sound completely absent of any uh, visual percept and vice versa, right? So those mm -hmm. are not like entangled in this way. Would you agree with that? 
Uh, sound, sound and vision. Percept. Percepts. They're not entangled yes, in the way that like shape and color are in the way that you're yeah, arguing. In, in that sense, no. Um, there may be an exception of that, not with synesthesia, but with the fact that like well, yeah, they're bound together. Aside. I know. Set aside, yeah. Bound with the fact that they're both related inextricably to my Cartesian ego. Like, I mean, I'm yeah, well, let, that, that's a somewhat different point here, but uh, yeah, I, somewhat I different, to, but I get into yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Um, but, well, actually, you know, but anyway, it's, it's not though, because it's 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 part of the same gestalt experience. I mean, there's this, you know, when you think of a sound, well, you think, well, a sound is correlated to a point in time, right? Which is an event. Well, what defines mm -hmm. an event? An event is two different, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a certain arrangement followed by another arrangement. And so then, well, how do I define this event, right? Well, the event is defined by everything that happens at the same time. And so you, you can actually get the, the whole binding thing. It, it's there. It's in the background. You don't see it right away, but it does slip in because you have this this thing where, you know, well, it's bound to the moment. Well, what defines the moment? Well, the moment is this sound plus those colors on the screen. And so even though, you know, zoomed in, it looks like they're dissociated. They actually are part of the same larger gestalt because it's it's well, that, that sort of moment. association is entirely unsurprising if we are beings that live in a temporal in temporal like space right, right. obviously the there are going to any stimulus that. is going to arrive at a particular moment in time and if they happen to two stimuli happen to coincide right but it's not surprising in that third person sense but i'm saying there is the first person experience of that though see what i'm saying like it, it's, but, it's okay so just to draw this back for our, for our listeners because i'm getting a bit lost as well the, the the argument here that you're trying to make is that the properties of um the, the properties of our first person experiences cannot be understood or reduced to uh, third person properties or third person states of affairs. Um, and as an argument for that, you have advanced the uh, the binding of certain visual perceptions, such as shape and color, as an example of something that is uh, sort of inexplicable because in sort of third person uh, way of thinking, like objective way of thinking, um, you, you could potentially dissociate those properties. Whereas it seems impossible, at least from your point of view, that those are dissociated. Um, so from my point of view, all that I need to do is provide an explanation as to why those properties or experiences are co-occur or are associated in our experiences. So I think it's extremely easy to do that with the case of like temporal ordering, because given that we are beings that live in a temporal universe, even though that's like emergent, but putting that aside, um, stimuli must occur at some period of time. And so when they co-occur in time, we perceive them as occurring at the same time, subject to, you know, issues of memory and uh, propagation delay and things like that so i just don't see that there's anything strange there now if i can then appeal to the example of vision versus sound that that i was referring to a moment ago the fact that those are sort of perceptually distinguishable you can have a, a visual percept without any sound and, and vice versa is because we have two entirely dis well two essentially distinct uh, perceptual systems you know vision and or audition right um mm -hmm. the fact that we cannot um at least normally that we cannot uh di that we cannot uh disentangle shape and um and color or in other words we cannot have a percept of color without that color being located somewhere in the visual field precisely emerges from the fact or it is caused by the fact that both of those percepts are created by the same perceptual system that is they're ultimately produced by photons hitting particular recept photoreceptors on our retina the information of color is extracted um, essentially from the same process that extracts the information about uh, where it's spatially located. That's why they can't be disassociated because the information is extracted in the same way. There's nothing really surprising here that those should, right. well, at no, least in normal you, conditions, uh, be bound together. You have a point there. The problem with this is, is that that's the third person description and that like, if you treat that as a classical system, yes, as a um, approximation, that's quite right, right? But the problem but, is, is that... It, your argument is that there's something about the qualia that can't be explained in third persons. And the argument was that it's this sort of correlation that's sort of perfect. And I'm arguing that we can understand why those are associated, at least in normal conditions. I right, think there but, might but, be exceptions the, the when things go wrong. The normal condition you bring up, though, is that it, it, it's, it's a very good approximation, but it's not perfect because those those cones are they're, they're picking up the, you know, the signal at the same time, so to speak. But it's not if you were like, you know, to get like a somehow some super sophisticated atomic clock to detect what's going on there they're not actually happening at the exact same time they're happening at like maybe a, a nanosecond or a microsecond apart yeah, well we can't perceive time to that 
because the the perception of time that we have is limited by the resolution of the firing of neurons, right? That's, oh, sure, that, sure, that sure. takes sure. several hundred milliseconds, he, he, and so we can't perceive those, time in smaller increments. We can't get, well, we can't we can't um, we can't perceive multiple like say nanoseconds in a row, right? As just no, we can't. Yeah, we can't. But the point is, so is there's that no he, problem <laughs> as no, long no, as they're no, close no, enough no, to no, within the, our the point resolution. That, the point I'm getting it is that that the experiences we do get are like it's like a so imagine you have like a, a film strip of the universe, right? And it, the film strip is like the smallest, you know, like a plank time or whatever, right? So each one of those film strip, each one of those um, film, uh, you know, screens or whatever, uh, film frames is a single plank time, right? And so obviously you can't measure those along the way, right? You can't, you know, you can't go from, you can't, you can't see plank time number one and then see plank time number yeah. 1 million and then see all the playing times and playing times are much smaller than that, but just, you know, as an analogy, um, you can't see all the playing times in between that. But the point I'm getting is that this isn't about seeing all the playing times in between that. This is at each individual moment. There is an exact, like, yes, you're not able to see those individual playing times in between. You can't differentiate this from this one because to you, it's really like more like a, you know, a 10th of a second or a 15th of a second or something like that. That's the situation, you know, you have one moment of time and then you have another moment of experience like a 15th of a second later or a 10th of a second later or something like that. But the point is, is that each one of those moments of experience would have to be a distinct gestalt. It can't be broken down further. Well, I, I think that you're you're mixing up arguments now because one of the arguments was about temporal identification and succession of, of moments. And I said that, look, we can understand the fact that a, a sight and a sound are temporally bound, that is, they appear to us to occur at the same moment, uh, because even though at the microscopic level there's there's going to be they're not going to occur at exactly the same time as you as you said, as long as they occur within a window of time that is sufficiently small such that well, we can't distinguish them, then we can explain the problem, why they appear though. to be that, simultaneous. That's the problem though, because see that window of time that that's what that's what I'm getting is that it, it's it's yes, it isn't happening at quote unquote the same time, or you know supposedly from the in regards to the third person mechanics yeah. of your eye or your retina or whatever doing its thing. But I'm saying in the experience itself, it's literally all frozen in at the exact same moment. Yeah, that's right. But I can explain precisely why that occurs in, in virtue of the fact that we're unable to perceive a greater temporal resolution. Just like if, if two objects are far enough away, they appear to be the same. You can't distinguish them. There's likewise a temporal resolution where if events happen too close in time, we can't distinguish them as separate because basically our neural processes take longer than that to, to process okay, the information. So, so they appear okay, to this be is, simultaneous. This is the problem. See, see, this is the problem is neural processes is that See, what I'm getting at here is that it's kind of an anti-emergentist argument, as it were, is that there is this, you can't um, break down the, see, how, like these, these neural processes can't function past, you know, I can't zoom into this smaller than this amount of time because it takes this amount of time to do it. The problem with that is, though, is that that means that you, you mean, objectively, outside of your first person experience, you can break down the, um, you know that third person process down into smaller and smaller units that we can't perceive yeah you know but the point is is that conscious experience can't be broken down like that so there's this there's this discord that's predicted by what i'm saying I, I i'm actually not understanding your point of disagreement here because it's precisely predicted by my theory which is just like um, let's call it emergentism for the sake of argument that you will not be able to experience um you know events that occur within like a nanosecond of time because neural processes take longer than that so what's the problem with the fact that that is the case? Because right. that's what's what I, predicted. I guess what I'm getting is, is, is the question is, is where is the consciousness at then? Like, is it like, say, if I were to freeze the time, right, at any one point in time, if that's the case, if I, if I froze time at that point, there would be no consciousness then. Well, consciousness is dynamic. It doesn't exist at a frozen moment in time. So I'm not sure what that's, that's objecting that's to. That's the problem. That's the problem, though. See, you see now... But that's true yeah. of any physical process. If you freeze a quantum system, what is it? Well, it doesn't even make sense. It's constantly the wave function is constantly evolving. It's constantly evolving, but you can you can have it at a, I mean that you can still have it at a frozen moment in time. In fact, the, the, the yeah, but you, universe is frozen. I, I don't know. Un, I don't understand. Well, that, that's that's an whether exception. there is a wave function of the universe is disputed. But let's not get the, into that. Um, I don't I don't really understand the point here. So you're asking me what would it be? What would it be like to have a frozen? perception i mean how could i possibly know that right because we aren't that sort you know, of being so we, we never experience have, that if you have um you know conscious experience from 
point A to point B, right? From you know yeah. time A to point time B, then you have this situation where um Let's see here. The point is that you have to be conscious all the way. I mean, we want to be all the way across per se, but there would have to be whenever you are conscious, you are conscious at that one moment in time. Like there is like if you were doing, you know, so you, you take all the individual frozen points along that film strip, so to speak. You say, well, are you conscious here? Well, no. Are you conscious here? Well, no. And like, no, no, no. And the reason no is because consciousness supposedly doesn't happen. You, you, you know, it doesn't happen at any one point in time. And then the, well, the question is, if it doesn't happen at this point, and this point, at this point, at this point, because supposedly according to you, it has to happen over this, you know, expanded period of time. It doesn't exist beyond that. Then there is no actual points in, in the entire film strip in which you are conscious, in which so, case so your that, consciousness does not exist. So no, that, that's just a fallacy, right? You're, you're saying that if there are no points at which consciousness exists, therefore it doesn't exist. That that's just false, right? It could be that consciousness requires existence it could only exist insofar as there's multiple, uh, like there's an interval of period over which right. exists, but okay, it doesn't well, exist. That point. Require, that's okay, entirely so possible. Supposedly, yes. Okay, so let's let's. That's the thing. I mean, so there's this. That's that's the problem is that it runs into the second problem then of emergentism, which I mean, it's your view. I get that. But the issue then is, is, well, you have emergentism. How do you break, you know, I, I, have, I have an epistemic problem with emergentism, shall we say, is the issue. It's, 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 it's you have to break the, you know, the, the first person down. It would require breaking the first person down into these smaller third person moments at which, you know, these all these these third person moments and then you have a collection of these third person moments the first personness does not exist in any one of those third person moments but as a aggregate whole it certainly kind of emerges yeah i think something like that might be appropriate note that i don't necessarily even know that moments exist in the way that you're talking about but i don't know that that's critical here i think time might i mean time might be continuous in in the relevant sense but i don't think that's relevant here so the issue i have though is that like it, it, I mean, it, it boils back down to that that epistemic problem I have of you you would require the first person coming out of a collection of third person. And yeah. You can't, you can't get the – there's an epistemic gap from well, conclusion to premises. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about that aspect. So, so one of your objections is sort of an ontological one about the properties of qualia, and we've been talking about that probably for long enough. And and then the second one is, is about this epistemic gap, right? So I, I actually don't see what your proposal, your proposal being that uh, mentality or consciousness or something is, is fundamental. I don't see how that's a better explanation because that's just saying, well, it just exists fundamentally. I mean, I, couldn't I just say, well, it just does emerge. Like, how is that? I don't see how one is better well, than the okay, other. So the issue is, is that, I mean, you could say in each case, like, it's like, it, it, it kind of boils down to a just because. Either it's just because it's emergent or just because it's fundamental. I guess the issue here is that the difference is, is that in this case, there has to be two just because. It's because there's a just because of emergence. And there's also a just because of, well, matter, right? So it's, it's like, it's kind of like the same what problem with dualism. There? The same problem as dualism, but instead of dual, instead of a second substance, you're adding a a second unexplained facet, which is, um, you know, emergence, right? So the point I'm getting at is with my model, there's this one element, there's this, you know, consciousness as a fundamental substance, and then so, and so let, yes, let me just clarify, sense, so, it's unexplained, but it's unexplained the same way that like. The, the building the, the base element of any one system is unexplained right like you start with your your rudimentary unit and then you explain everything else from that right every system has its fundamental thing in it right so is your proposal that ever or your understanding or whatever that your that you would advocate is that what exists fundamentally is let's say some sort of entangled quantum information system which is conscious or maybe mm-hmm. which is consciousness if you would prefer to say it that way is that is that what you think yeah yeah okay so okay so i don't actually see how that's fundamentally different from what i say except i'd say let 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 me i mean this is not exactly what i believe but let me just sort of say what about this version what exists fundamentally is some sort of um entangled quantum information certain states of which are conscious and i just say the whole thing is conscious well yeah Uh, yeah that's pretty much the difference between the two of us (laughs) 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's not that far apart that, in some respect. At that level of crudity, I'm not sure that one is is better than the other, right? I mean, I, what you'd want to talk about is, well, what sort of things would we predict would be conscious, and how does the theory account for this or that? Um, see, I, under your theory, like, I, I don't think rocks are conscious, right? So, I mean, obviously, I can't prove that they're not, but a theory that predicts that rocks are conscious, even in a, a modest extent, seems seems wrong to me. And so, I, well, I would argue that. Well, it's not necessarily predicting that. It, it's what it's is. There's consciousness and there's stuff in consciousness. So, so for example, let's say you have a dream, right? And in your dream, you're conscious, but you have an environment around you and you see a rock, right? And you say, well, I don't have any good reason to believe the rock is conscious. And well, in that case, the rock isn't conscious because the rock is not, it's not conscious in itself. Rather, it is a part, it is in your consciousness. It is a part of your consciousness. So it's it's not like it, it itself has its own agency, its own mentality. It's that it is a. But it if has all a quantum mental... information is, if all entangled quantum information is conscious, then surely that would. Well, that's the rock, thing. Right? At that level, at that level, yes, but that level does not apply. So this has to do with the whole reference frame thing, right? So you have, um, you're familiar with how quantum mechanics is um, re reference frame dependent. Uh, well. Standard quantum mechanics isn't right because it's quantum field theory that brings in special uh, that incorporates special relativity. So that's reference frame dependent. No, no, not that reference frame, not that kind of reference frame. I'm not talking about relativistic reference. I'm talking about. Oh, what do you mean then? Uh, the relation. Okay, so they in 2019 they did this this test with it was basically a version of the Wigner's friend thought experiment, uh, but it was an experimental version of it. Is Rovelli's uh, relational quantum mechanics where you have. Um, there's some issues with his model, but like the relationality aspect of it. So basically, uh, Schrodinger's cat's in the box; it's dead and alive, right? Well, from Schrodinger's cat's perspective, he's either dead or alive. And then you have Wigner's friend who's inside the laboratory. Well, Wigner's Wigner's friend says, "I'm not in superposition. I'm a a solid. You know, I'm I'm observing myself. Quite fine. I'm I'm definitely not in. I'm not a happy and sad." Uh, researcher at the same time based on what the cats that are alive but from Wigner's fr frame who's outside the room his friend and the cat in the box are simultaneously in superposition to get right and so whether or not those are those are separate reference frame not in a relativistic sense but in a um quantum sense it's it's the the, the cats yeah that's really dependent on your interpretation of quantum mechanics well that's the thing is that it's not dependent on the interpretation of quantum mechanics anymore because they actually uh, experimentally demonstrated that in 2019, an experimental illustration of that. Um, well, thing. I don't know what you mean by of that. If what you mean is correlations between states, then that that, that doesn't. Well, no. What they what they that showed was that what they showed was that uh, a system, a particular system, was entangled in one frame while not being entangled in another frame. Mm. At the same, well, I can't really comment on that because I don't haven't read okay. the paper. But let's just continue. Okay, so the, the point is, is that. In this particular case, there is at, at like say the gods level, right? You know, there's this big all mind, as it were. In that case, yes, the rock is going to be a part of God's consciousness because that's at God's frame where everything is one giant entangled system. Okay. And that would be kind of akin, not exactly akin, but that would be akin to Wigner outside of the room. Okay. And then you go down a level and you have, well, at a smaller level, though, you have instead of one gigantic entanglement at the God's eye view, you have these collection of smaller entanglements. And then at that level, so at the God's eye view, yes, the the um, the rock is a part of the gestalt of God's consciousness. OK. But down at this level, you're just seeing separate objects. And this is just an element in consciousness this is not conscious itself. It's, it's this other little at the level at which the rock actually instantiates as a collapsed wave function it's no longer in that it's not it's not in 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 so far as it's a collapsed wave function it's not in that particular reference frame anymore and then it by it, it would not necessarily be conscious in and of itself now it could do something be like a percept in consciousness rather well that's something that doesn't make sense to me because i don't understand the notion that a wave function be, can be collapsed and not collapsed and in a superposition at the same time now i know that that's rel relative to what you were talking about the reference frame thing before that doesn't make sense according to my really any of the interpretations that, well, that it, I'm aware all of. it means all it means is that collapse is relative to reference frame so it is collapsed in this reference frame, but it's not collapsed in that reference frame. I think that might work if you take an epistemic uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, where this was ontic. Collapsed... This was ontic. It was well, an yeah. Experiment. That doesn't make any sense to me because that seems to be saying that reality is fundamentally um, 
is fundamentally uh, rel- relative, right? That there's no absolute state of affairs. Now that's more than than special relativity because special relativity just says that the simultaneity of events is relative to reference frame. Uh, but there are there are things that are like the um, uh, what is it? The space time interval is the same for all reference frames, and and all physical observations and laws of physics are the same in every reference frame. But this seems to be saying that whether objects even exist or what state they exist in is relative reference frame. And at that point, I don't even know how you can talk about an objective reality. It seems that everyone's living in their own reality at that point. Well, okay. like different things are collapsed. There's, there's two make ways sense to, to go about this. There's two ways to go about this. Okay. The first way is to simply say, yes, there is, but it has to do with keeping your reference frame straight. So in the same way that like, you know, in relativity, they have these paradoxes where in this reference frame, something has, you know, this particular length contraction, and you know versus this amount of uh, time dilation but wait it can't be because then it would have this other paradox it would have well no it's because it, it's only because you mix reference frames so yes, right it is objectively true that it is collapsed in reference frame a1 but in reference frame a2 it is not collapsed because that it, it, it's it's because a1 is not a2 it's just you have to keep your reference frame straight now the flip side to this and this is where it gets irritating. Like, how can you keep an objective reality? Um, the the title for the particular, this was kind of obviously a popularization, but they made some, I forget the exact title, but it was some of the effect of a uh, quantum physics experiment debunks objective reality or something like that. <laughs> it's like, no, we do live in a subjective reality. And I, I, I prefer personally, I prefer the other one because it, you know, I, I like the notion of, objective reality at least in a you know a nominal sense you know, keep the reference real make sure we we keep our reference frame straight and we kind of avoid that problem but the other one is the, kind of the bite the bullet thing of just saying it it, it it is subjective which is it kind of irritates me but that's how it was being run with for a while the results of that experiment okay so so your view is that essentially whether or not we call a particular uh, entity like a rock conscious is going to depend on the reference frame from which we assess that. Yeah. I mean, so okay. from the God's eye point of view, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. There was this, um, thing's been going around recently. It's this, it was posted on my, someone posted a copy of this on my idealism and science versus atheism book, um, page, but I was like in the middle of like, a, you know, my, my issue in LA where I was emotionally messed up. So I was like, just push it off later. But it was they're trying to basically derive uh, from the same kind of quantum idealist framework a uh, hermetic philosophy, and they had this notion of I, I like to look into it and then read some of the material on it. Like you know, a couple of years later when I had had time and wasn't preoccupied with stuff, and they had this one quote of how uh, the all in cat you know t uh, the uh, in capital letters mean like like calling it synonymous synonymous for God in hermetic philosophy is a uh, the all is in the earthworm, but the earthworm is not or like you see like the the earthworm is not the all, but the all is in the earthworm or something like that. So mm-hmm. even though it's it's um you know they're it, it, down at this level, these things are distinct from this big supermind. From the God's eye point of view, God is in all the other things. Even though those individual things are not the same thing as the big God's eye point of view, where they're all part of this, you know, distinct gigantic mind. Right. Well, that's interesting. I'll need to look up more about quantum reference frames to see if I can make any any sense of this idea. Um, I yeah, it's not obvious to me that that is a more parsimonious or I don't know a better explanation than what I would postulate. But I I don't know that we're going to make any progress on that. Well, on I that should just see the here. experiment because it was actually. I mean, it was a. Uh... Do you have a link to that that you could? That you yeah, could share so I, I can have a look think, later. No, I think this is it. I'm going to send this to you. I. It's been some time. As I've seen this, maybe this is a, I thought it was in February it was done in. This might be it. Do not quote me on this. This might be it. Um, this is the Wigner's friend. Is a, a Wigner's friend experiment. I don't know if it's the one because I thought the one was done. In, maybe it just public. I remember calling it, seeing it in uh, February sometime. And then it, it just might have been officially passing like publication in like May or something like that. But um yeah, I just sent what I think is the one to you. So, uh, yeah, cool. Thanks for that. All right. Oh, here's um, the one with the irritating. Here's the one with the irritating. Um, it's from MIT Technology Review. It has the irritating uh, 
title in it. Uh, here we go. Quantum experiment. A quantum experiment suggests there is no such thing as objective reality. Yes. Well, the popularizations are often a bit. Misleading. I know. I know. It's it, it, it's it's funny because it technically fits your what you were describing as, but Johan, and that would mean there is no objective reality. Yes. <laughs> All right. I, I think we talked about most of the things um, for uh, that that you mentioned initially and that I wanted to cover. So we talked about quantum cognition. We talked a bit about some of the experimental points that you mentioned and uh, then some of the like philosophical quality and the emergent space based arguments. Just on a, oh, yeah. A, and at the start, we talked about level. emergent space. On a heuristic so. level. OK, this is this is not like a strong argument, but it's heuristic just to try to like impress the point with the the um, the emergent space time stuff. You have to take a look at some of those uh, analogies between virtual reality properties and um, modern physics phenomenon, because it's really some of them actually are more than analogies. Like we discovered that the uh, the general relativity one with you know when you open like too many pages on your computer, your computer starts slowing down, right? There's actually a direct analogy between that and a mass and energy slowing time down in um, general relativity. And you think, well, that's just an analogy, you know, uh, coincidence or what I, well, it turns out there's a guy named Ted Jacobson who has this theorem, he used holography, and he showed that you can, instead of deriving um, holography from relativity and quantum mechanics, you can go the other way around and you can say um, you have holography, you add entropy, and then when you add entropy into it, you get back general relativity automatically. And the argument was it, it, it was it was kind of interesting because it was basically saying the information density itself was what was slowing the time down. It was kind of cool because it's like, oh, there's this neat parallel. And they had other ones with a, there was a guy giving a talk on I forget what the it was some conference tech conference, and he was he was a programmer for Second Life, and he was saying they had this programming problem in Second Life where they were having a problem with marbles tunneling through cups. And they couldn't stop it. And they're like, well, this is a problem. And they, they realized that it had to do with the computation limits of the the computer game. They were, you know, of any of actually any virtual reality. And it would simply because it's being, you know, simulated, it would automatically produce uh, something like quantum tunneling, no matter how hard they tried to get rid of it. It was very fascinating because it was like like and there's a there's a guy named Whitworth, and this is this is all just heuristic, mind you. It's not a strong argument. It's heuristic. And he had these these like like a table of um, virtual reality properties, that are results of information processing effects, and then he would go over and then look at the. Oh, I think this is the paper that IP cites. Yeah, it's the Whitworth paper. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah, all very, I've talked it's, about it's that not before. Super strong. It's not like a strong argument, but it, it's a it's a it's a strong heuristic, and it, it gets you thinking. It's like, I mean, you, know, well, you can make the technical strong argument from emergent space time, but like this is like. You can actually kind of see this is very popular people because you know people who play computer games a lot, for example, will see. Oh, I know what I've seen that before. That that happened when I was playing my you know Minecraft game the other day. Have a thing. Like I didn't realize that was the same thing as as uh, you know phonon pairs and superconductivity or quantum tunneling or whatnot. But then they can see the parallels and like it, it gives you a whole new way of thinking about um, counterintuitive properties of modern physics. Yeah, well, there's certainly many of those. And I'll put a link to that and some of the other things that we've been talking about uh, in the description if people are interested in checking out a bit more than that. Are there any final comments that you wanted to make before we close out today? I'll let you have the last word. Uh, I don't think so offhand. Um, I just think that this model actually would explain. It, it, it's the only one I know of that could explain the hard problem. I actually, had a, 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 that's the paper I'm working on publishing right now is that um, Chalmers actually wrote a paper on this um, he didn't use quantum idealism, but he used, he used a lot of the ideas that I was popularizing some years back. And he called it cosmic idealism. And he says it's a possible solution to the hard problem. And what I'm doing right now is I'm taking Levine's explanatory gap and then using that explanatory, you know, the, the, the premises must be found in the, the conclusion must be found in the premises to argue that this is actually, if there, if there is a solution to the hard problem to be found, it would have to be inside of the um, quantum idealism or cosmic idealism um, uh, set, basically. Simply because of the epistemic constraints of what the problem entails. 
Mm. Well, there's certainly many uh, many puzzles and uh, phenomena that we'll continue to understand over time, whether or not uh, we accept your approach or something different. But thanks uh, very much for joining me today, Johanan. Uh, it was uh, hopefully an interesting discussion. I think it I was, understand it, it a little bit better. Is that a little better, I think? I mean, did it kind of clear up some of the issues that you raised in your critique video? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, obviously I still have points of disagreement that we discussed, right. but I, I do understand, I think, a bit better how, how the theory fits together. So that's uh, that's certainly helpful. And this is kind of interesting, too, because it, it, it's if you think about this, it's just as like a, a playing with the idea as like a hypothetical, right? You can explain a lot of things that you would see in religion or like, you know, what people would normally call, quote unquote, supernatural. But they kind of now kind of fit together in a way that would seemingly fit a naturalistic heuristic instead. Like, you know, you, people talk about a, a quote, you know, religion, people in religion would talk about like a supernatural domain. And then you occasionally have people having these weird stories of, you know, ghosts or angels or demons or, or whatnot, right? You know, either in folklore or, you know, people's, you know, anecdotal accounts, et cetera, or just in religion. But it's kind of interesting because you have this, this situation now where you have a, a very natural way to explain that is kind of in the simulation versus outside the simulation. See, it's it's not magic. It's it's as a there's a logical way of thinking about it that actually mm. would follow from the framework of the model. Well, yes, uh, paranormal experiences is uh, something. Whether or not they're uh, real, you know, it's, just, it's, it's it, 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 reputed to be. It just as a, a way of um, playing with the you know the model see what you can do with it and it's kind of funny because all the stuff that you see in kind of a religious worldview would kind of fall out of this but in a way that does not inquire like magic or something outside of science or something that is you know you kind of have to have like a a superstitious way of thinking to uh, to, to hold on to hmm. not to say that it's real just to say that it, it's it's a it's a interesting it's possible with this and it's an interesting way of um, thinking about it because it's you you can actually think about it coherently now rather than it being like a a permanent mystery or something that can always only be beyond human comprehension or whatnot right uh well thanks for coming today and uh take care everyone in chat thanks for joining us and as i said i'll stick some links in the uh in the description of the video so you can follow some more up uh, yourself i'll also put a link to johanna's channel so you can have a look at his videos and um, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, talk to you again later.